Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend, the D and What If, with another fanfiction. This is the first part of What If Deku Were Dead and he reincarnated into a cat. All credits for this video go to their respective authors, so please support the real author. Check out the link in the description for more details. Please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. I have a way you can be a hero, Deku. Take a swan dive off a roof and pray for a quirk in your next life. Back Hugo taunted while shoving past Izuku. That sick and sinister glint in his red eyes as he and Izuku locked gazes. Is it possible for someone, someone like me, to be a hero without a quirk? Please. Izuku whimpered while he bowed so low to All Might. The man injured so badly that he was only faking being healthy and well. A threadbare man of skin and bone in front of Izuku. The man that Izuku had looked up to his whole life. Izuku's nose touched the ground as he whimpered weakly. I have to know. He croaked out between his tears. Without a quirk, All Might was quiet for too long as he contemplated the question. Honestly, no, not in today's day and age. You need to be more realistic. I'm sorry. No, no, be realistic. No, tears free fell from Izuku's eyes as he tore his notebook apart after All Might left him. After All Might left him on that stupid rooftop, ripped paper flew through the wind, and violent heartbroken sobs rocketed Izuku's frame around. Eventually, he just threw the notebook off the roof and soon threw his yellow backpack off as well. He watched his bag fall weightlessly before crashing onto the cold ground below. Izuku was soon standing on the very edge of the roof. He stared down at the ground beneath him. How far down it looked to him yet dot 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 it didn't look far enough. His breath hitched as more sobs left his mouth. Take a swan dive off of a roof. He muttered to himself as a freeing breeze brushed through his hair. What was just suicide bait from an old friend a soon-to-be ex-friend now didn't sound so bad. It sounded. It sounded nice, actually. Izuku was tired. He was so damn tired. Tired of waking up every morning and painting a stupid smile on his face. Tired of being knocked around in the hallways, pushed down, kicked, and beaten. He was tired of being a laughing stock, of being a punching bag that life made of him. Okay, please, let my quirk be something, something worth living for. He let his arms fall limply to his sides and simply tilted his body forward right off the edge. He felt nothing. He only wished for one thing as he fell, and the ground was coming to meet him. He just wished that it wouldn't hurt, as it would turn out. He couldn't even kill himself right because Izuku opened his eyes. When he blinked blearily at the world, he was, at first, confused about what had happened. His mind ran blank. He was confused about why he was waking up on the ground. But it wouldn't take long for him to remember. To remember everything. Of course, because I'm God's punching bag. His body felt weird, but he chalked that up to waking up and still feeling confused. The what? 14-story drop wasn't helping his brain. Not at all. How am I still alive? I made sure to fall head first. Izuku rested his head back on the ground with a low sigh and shut his eyes. His whole body rumbled weakly with this soul deep sigh that left his nose. His head was feeling somewhat fuzzy. He just wanted to close his eyes and hope that he wouldn't rewaken this time around. Haven't I suffered enough? He wanted to whine and curse at the world and sky above for this rotten luck of his. He would lay there on the ground, unwilling to move another inch. That was until his senses started to clear up. What was strange was the first sense to rock him was his sense of smell. It would become intense, so intense that it almost made him feel sick. He could smell the dirt beneath him, the smell of the grass, trees, and he paused to sniff the air flowers. But there was another scent, one that smelt far but not far at the same time. He sensed something disgusting. It reminded him of when he found a dead mouse festering in a mouse trap. Then came his hearing. He thought his sense of smell became intense. His hearing was worse. Izuku heard soft noises at first. Something small scuttling away from him that didn't sound too far away. However, before too long, his hearing started to pick up rapidly. Noises became louder, almost deafening to him. He could pick up the sounds of cars moving to and fro. The sounds of people having conversations. No dot 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 wait. He picked up on crying. So he was noticed. But he couldn't hear footsteps approaching him. Checking on him, asking if he was okay. He wasn't. He just jumped from a high building. Clearly, he wasn't okay. Maybe they just thought of him as dead. I can't believe he cheated on me. A woman bemoaned as she whizzed by Izuku. I gave him eight years of my life eight. What? Izuku wasn't sure it was possible to be even more confused than before, but he was. Izuku knew he was going to have to open his eyes to see around him just so he could get some semblance of what was going on around him but his head was still slightly fuzzy and the light was far too bright, but he was just going to have to push past it. Izuku braced himself for the pain when he opened his eyes. The pain would come again. That familiar stabbing pain when he would face the sunlight. However, this time around, Izuku pushed through the pain. He had to open and close his eyes until he could handle it. Once the pain of the sunlight slowly subsided and his head didn't feel too fuzzy to continue on, he kept his eyes open and looked around him. As expected, he was on the concrete, and yet, 
People moved past him without so much as a second glance. Nobody really looked at him, and some even stepped over him. He watched a man make great strides in doing so while he chatted idly on his phone. Then dot 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 all at once, it was like cotton was removed from Izuku's ears. Sounds were almost like explosions in his ears, loud and never-ending. He could hear things that he never would think about generally, like the sound of cars whizzing by, the sounds of people talking near him, and way off in the distance. Izuku didn't know how this was happening, but he could hear people far away from him clear as day. He could listen to their regular conversations and not even just that. What in the, kitty, a little girl came jogging up to him. This girl, who couldn't be older than three, with red velvet colored hair and eyes to match, ran up to Izuku. The thing was, this little girl looked giant. Now that he thought about it, as his head started to clear, everyone looked like giants to him. I'm not a kitty, cat cat, Issa. Before the girl could lean down to pet him, her mother grabbed her by her wrist to stop her. Instantly the girl screamed in frustration as she wasn't allowed to get any closer to him. No, we don't pet strays, especially not ones that look like that. The mother scolded her daughter harshly. I'm not a cat. Izuku told her like that would clear everything up for them all. He wasn't a cat. He was a human. The woman sneered at him before taking her purse and nearly hitting him with it. Shoo, go spread rabies elsewhere. She hissed, and when the purse nearly hit him, Izuku was suddenly trying to scramble up to his feet. His whole body felt strange when standing, and he found walking onerous. When he was standing, he realized people were giants. The little girl was wailing as her mother started to lead her away from Izuku. Izuku's legs kept buckling to the point that he finally looked down at himself, hoping, praying, that he would see his familiar red shoes, but no. No sneakers, only paws. He looked down at two green furred paws. This can't be happening. Panic struck through his chest while his blood turned ice. He moved his right foot paw up and moved it, so he was looking at paw pads. Paw pads. His heart raced faster and faster while the panic nearly crushed him into an ice cold grip. No dot 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 and oh. This couldn't be happening. He flexed his paw and watched as sharp claws poked out for only a moment before he nearly jumped back in shock. Izuku looked at the people walking around him. Some were on their phones while others talking to one another. No, no, I'm not doing much. I just can't believe this happened. My mom is such a bitch. Nobody looked at Izuku. Nobody even gave him a second glance. Save for the little girl from only moments ago. A man walked by and didn't seem to be on his phone or with anyone. So, Izuku started to trot. Yes, trot along with the man. Sir, he called to get the man's attention. He heard his voice leave his mouth, so clearly, he was speaking, right? Sir, can you understand me? H.M. The man paused and looked down at Izuku. He was older, in his late fifties, with no hair on his head. He looked down at Izuku, and Izuku saw the man wearing thick rectangular glasses. Well, aren't you cute? He gave Izuku a smile. Such a cute kitty he reached down to pet Izuku, and Izuku quickly backed away from the hand, trying to pat between his ears. No, can you understand me? Izuku wanted to cry, to wail, he needed confirmation. Oh, uh, are you hungry? The man reached into his pocket and pulled out a small packet of something. I guess it's a good thing I have these on me, isn't it? When he unfurled the almost empty package, Izuku realized it was dried anchovies. The man quietly poured a tiny bit out on the street for him. There you go. I have to go now. You be a good kitty and head home soon. The man gave him a smile before taking off. Izuku was shell-shocked as he just sat on the sidewalk. His jaw dropped, and his whole body just felt numb. Numb with panic and numb with fear. Instead, he could only stare at the dried fish in a small pile beside him. They smelt good, and, despite everything, he did feel a little hungry. Still, he couldn't bring himself to eat. He was a cat. He was a cat. He had tried to kill himself, and somehow he became a... a cat. No, Izuku couldn't eat. He had to look at his reflection and see it to truly and utterly believe it. He ignored the fish pile and trotted down the sidewalk. His trot quickly turned into a run. This was Musutafu, a big city with more prominent buildings that often had reflective windows on the outside. It wouldn't be long before he would find such a building. Izuku stared at his own reflection. There, looking back at him, was a cat. A cat with fluffy green fur that made him look like a puffball. Fur that will mat unless taken care of properly. This cat had big green eyes to match the fur color with white whiskers by his muzzle. He felt like he was going to faint. It's not me dot 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 it's not. It can't be. He was convinced that his eyes had to be playing tricks on him. That this couldn't be possible, but it was. With a somewhat shaky forepaw, he raised his right foot and patted at his own ear. He watched with unblinking eyes. His reflection followed this exact movement. Izuku wanted to cry in fact he was crying. He watched as tears fell down his face slowly, not as if he were human. He had to blink one tear away from his eyes at a time. Tears didn't just freely flow. I don't understand dot 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 was I hit by a quirk on my way down. Did someone save me but leave me stuck like this? Izuku didn't know. He didn't know anything. What he did know was that he should probably go home. 
Heaven only knows how worried his mom must be for him. He didn't have anything on him like he would if he were human. No phone to check the time or to call his mother, nothing. He didn't know if it were still the same day as when he jumped. So, Izuku did the only thing he could only think to do at that time and point. He started to walk home. Maybe he could somehow communicate with his mother. Somehow, let's see, I think I know where I am. I hope anyways, everything is so different when you're small. If I'm correct, then I should be near the train station. I'll just need to board the next train. It was so surreal. Things he would pass by every day without a second glance were huge compared to his small stature, like a man selling fruits or a local kiosk selling hot meat buns. They were usually chest level and were now like mountains. He trotted down the sidewalk with relative ease now. He was quickly growing accustomed to his paws and how to walk on all fours. It was a little strange but not all that strange to learn to use four limbs. It was almost the same as everyday walking, just putting one paw in front of the other. Nobody bothered him when he walked. Everyone either didn't see him or just didn't care about him. He was also given much more room to move as he just walked between people slipping around them with relative ease. This became especially useful when he came up to the train station, which became much more crowded with people. At first, he was polite. After all, Izuku was always polite, but the knowledge that he was a cat for the time being and knowing that cats don't abode by society, that he didn't have to wait in line for a ticket back home because he was a cat filled him with glee. It also helped that, as a cat, he no longer had the money to buy a ticket. And so, next thing he knew, he was literally stepping on people's toes past the turnstiles. He broke off into a run once he was free of the crowd. Nobody really yelled or chased him down. And absolutely nobody called him a thief for doing this. His run would die down, and soon he would go back into a leisurely trot to his respective train. He boarded the train without a second of hesitation. Once on the train, he jumped into the empty seat. Why? Because he was a cat. He didn't have to stand with hundreds of other sweaty people breathing in his face. Now, if someone who needed the seat came on, he'd be more than happy to scooch over to give them most of the chair. But he wasn't moving. No, Izuku was sure he deserved to sit after all he's been through in one day. Thank you very much. From having his dreams crushed, trying to kill himself, and then waking up as a cat, he has the right to be selfish just this once. What's funny is nobody tried to move him. HM, I could almost get used to this. He realized but didn't relish in it too hard. No, he wanted to be human again. I hope mom isn't too worried about me. I guess I should have thought about that before I tried to kill myself. A huff left his nose while he rested his head on his paws. I just, I don't know what I was thinking, really. Kilt slowly ate away at his chest and made it feel like a cavity that needed to be filled again. The last thing Izuku wanted was for his mother to worry about him even more. So by the time the train ride ended, he decided that when he got his body back, he'd never tell her what had happened. No, this would just be his little secret and his alone. In a weird way, he was thankful to whoever struck him with their quirk. The train would soon stop at the station Izuku needed to be at. He hopped off and padded away from the train with ease. He's so well trained. He heard a woman whisper about him as he walked away from her. I've only heard stories about animals taking trains. That's crazy. Izuku, once again, squeezed past people, slipping between their feet and legs with ease and grace that he never had before. He was soon free from the crowd and train station, and down the road he went. He walked down the sidewalk like a cat on a mission. He had noticed that the cars by the road were loud while in this form. They were so loud that it hurt his ears. The motors and vibrations in his feet almost made him want to turn and run away from the noisy area. When a semi-truck passed the sidewalk, he debated taking a shortcut through an alley but decided against it. He knew his way home from the main road, not the back paths, and he was liable to get lost if he tried to do so. He followed the sidewalk dutifully, noting how it felt like it was taking much longer. Of course, it's taking longer. My legs are tiny now. What would usually be a 10-minute walk has turned into a 45-minute walk. He thought anyway. He had no sense of time at the moment, save for the sun, but that wasn't much help. He would come to see the apartment building, and Izuku broke into a run once it was in sight. He was so ready to go home and see his mother again. With the run, he was much faster than before and made it to the apartment building with ease but he would soon find his first snack. The door. He sat in front of the door and stared at it for way longer than he should have. The door was a push-out door, with each entry being cumbersome, meaning there was no way he was getting in this way. He saw no one coming out and nobody coming in. Still, he was patient. He waited for a while outside of the door, waiting for somebody, anybody, to open the door one way or another. Nobody came. So, after finally growing impatient, Izuku gave up on that idea. Instead, he found himself behind the complex, looking up at the fire escape. Our home is on the third floor, in the middle. One of those windows is my mother's room. I think it's that one on the right. He looked up at the open window on the right of the third floor. 
His mother often opened the windows during midday to help cool the place down as they didn't have an AC in their apartment. Izuku felt his body shake as he stood on his hind legs. He then pressed his front paws on the first step of the fire escape ladder. I've seen cats do this before, so it shouldn't be that hard to replicate, right? He was only now missing his thumbs. He couldn't grip the ladder correctly, which made him a little nervous. He had to climb the ladder up to the first balcony. Once on the first balcony, it would be stairs from there on out. Izzy Paisy, right? It's like doing push-ups. Push yourself up with your front paws and then use your back legs to kick off. I can do that, right? He spoke to himself while looking up at the top of the ladder. The ladder was maybe 10 feet long, something Izuku would never usually question but now, when Izuku wasn't as tall as he once was, now that he was a cat, it was a different story. He felt like he climbing something much much higher now. No backing out. Izuku steeled himself and gave himself that first push up to start his mission. He went up the first step of the ladder and quickly braced his back feet on the step below him. He did this in quick succession. Up higher and higher, he would go as he hopped from step to step. He didn't know how he did it, but he had. Before he knew it, he was on the first balcony. Izuku's heart was pounding as he stared at the ground that looked far below him. Well, he thought. His ears went back as a bit of fear seeped into his body. He made a note not to look down as he climbed the stairs more easily than climbing the ladder. He was on the third floor before he knew it, but he quickly faced a problem. The window was high, and he was a cat. It wasn't too terribly high away from the balcony, but for Izuku, it looked like it was another story up. His ears flicked in irritation while he looked up at the window sill. I have to jump. Izuku didn't want to jump. He didn't know if he could jump as high or as well as a cat. Climbing the ladder didn't count because he wasn't really jumping. Just glorified push-ups. Come on dot 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 the window isn't going to come to me. I have to jump. His lip curled a little while he backed away from the window sill. He stared at the sill and crouched low. Izuku braced himself while his haunches and shoulders started to wiggle. Now, he felt ready and ran before leaping high into the air. I do have the power of leaping like a cat, he realized, but that would be the only thing he would recognize before he missed the window. Well dot 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 he didn't miss it. Technically, Izuku landed on it, but he miscalculated the leap, the window ledge and he collided, and Izuku tried desperately to keep himself on it. He sank his claws into the windowsill and tried to painstakingly claw his way up to the safety of the window. It wasn't easy, surprisingly, as he dangled, but by using his claws on both his front and back paws to help himself up, he managed to claw his way up. Oh god, please let me be human soon. Izuku thought to himself the moment he was safe and on all four paws again. With a shaky exhale, he, with no warning, started to lick at his chest to ease his growing anxiety. It felt strangely pleasant, the way his rough tongue would lap at his fur. He enjoyed the feeling, as after a few laps, he was feeling better. Okay, he looked inside his mother's room. The room was dark, no light was on, with the only light source coming from the door, which was slightly ajar. It was much easier jumping down into the bedroom than jumping to the window sill. He made a beeline for the cracked door and used his paw to push it open. When he poked his head through the door, he expected the apartment to be as he remembered, but it wasn't. For a moment, he feared he had accidentally stepped into the wrong apartment building as he didn't recognize the place only because of how barren it was. Mom, he spoke softly. He cautiously stepped out of her bedroom and started to trot along the carpeted floor. The whole place was so oddly quiet that Izuku really thought he had walked into the wrong building, an abandoned one. But he quickly picked up on a noise in the apartment. Crying. His mother's crying. It's better this way, Inkai. Auntie. Izuku's voice was soft once again as he stepped to his bedroom, where he would peek inside the open door. The door had only opened a crack, but it was enough for him to see inside. His room was also packed, with his mom sitting on his barren bed while Mitsuki Bakugo hugged her tightly. Both women had tears in their eyes. It's what Izuku would have wanted. Sweetie dot 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 he would have wanted you to move out of this lonely place. Mitsuki whispered, all while holding on to Inko's trembling form tightly. Her own voice quivered. Mitsuki ran her fingers through Inko's messy locks. I miss him so much. Inko whispered, and soon sobs would spill out of her mouth. I know. I do too. He was such a good kid. She sniffled before Mitsuki wiped her tears eyes with her knuckles. But dot 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 it's going to be okay. We're going to help you, Mitsuki whispered and she looked up at the ceiling. Inko gritted her teeth to keep from sobbing, but she would fail, she cried loud in heartbreaking sobs that would rack her entire frame violently. I want my baby. She screamed and covered her eyes with both of her hands. Izuku had never heard his mother cry like this. Yes, they were both prone to crying over the most minor things, but these cries, these wails, and sobs, they were different. His ears went back while his whole body went cold. I don't understand. I know, I know. Mitsuki would allow Inko to cry on her shoulder. It's going to be okay. Izuku. Izuku's in a better place. Her voice quivered into a whine as she tried to hold back her tears. He's dot 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 he's happier now. 
Izuku's fur bristled as he started to back up slowly from the door. No, he thought while giving his head a shake. It's not fair. I, I, I keep expecting him to walk through that door. I keep expecting him to ask me to make pork katsudan for dinner I more heartbreaking sobs as Inko threw herself back on the bed in sorrow. I, I know, trust me, Katuski has been held up in his room all month. It hasn't been easy on him, learning of Izuku's. Learning what Izuku did the same day he was attacked by that villain. It felt like someone put Izuku into an icy bath as he continued to slowly inch away from the door. What Izuku did. Katsuki has been held up in his room all month. Month. So, it turns out God had a sick sense of humor. Not only was Izuku not given a quirk in his next life, but he was a cat. He was a cat. He would never become human again. Izuku Midoriya was dead, and he reincarnated into a cat. He couldn't face his mother. No, he would hide out of her line of sight when she and Mitsuki would eventually leave his old bedroom that had been packed up with the rest of the apartment. Inko was holding only a lone box in her arms. She wiped the remaining tears from her eyes and sniffled her tears back. Goodbye, Izuku. Inko then flicked the lights off before leaving the apartment. This just left Izuku in the dark. Mom, goodbye. He had a lot to think about. Learning to be a cat when one was once previously human was both easy and not so easy. Knowing that his fur was a natural blanket for the chilly nights was nice, but learning where to sleep on said chilly nights weren't. His first night alone he slept inside of an abandoned mattress. Yes, inside the mattress. As the mattress was propped up on a wall and too heavy for him to tip back up right on the ground. He then moved behind the mattress to sleep on the ground when he found a hole inside the back of the mattress, no doubt made by raccoons. Well, save for the bugs, it was abandoned and perfect for him, at least for that first night. The next day, after properly rested, Izuku awoke inside the mattress and then promptly removed himself from that shelter. Then, that second day, it was like reality finally set in that chilly dewy morning when Izuku's stomach finally caught up to him and let out a fierce growl, demanding food. So, he came to the realization that he had to be a cat. Does this mean I have to dot 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 eat mice? Izuku physically gagged at that idea. He was a cat, yes, but he still had his human memories and remembered his life before. He shouldn't have to eat rodents. He was smarter than the average cat. So, Izuku sought off. He was going to get some food without having to hunt for it. First, he started down the sidewalk. Like before people most ignored him, or went through great lengths of avoiding him on the sidewalk. Izuku trotted down with his head held high. He would find his first place for breakfast a Shoyaki street vendor. The fish smelt delightful. It made Izuku's mouth water and he started to quickly jog up faster to the vendor. Sir, sir, please can I have a fish? He knew at this point that he wasn't heard by humans. No, he was meowing. The man started to quickly look around until his eyes landed on Izuku. Oh no, you don't you mangy cat. Shoo. The man shot his foot out in an attempt to kick Izuku away. My fish, please. I'm starved. His meowing turned into yowling as he quickly moved before he was kicked. Leave. Suddenly something smacked his rump and Izuku let out another, more shocked, yowl and he took off rushing away from the vendor. When he looked back after he was at a safe distance away he saw that the cook's partner, a woman, holding a broom. Izuku felt his fur bristle before stalking away from the vendor. That's fine. They aren't the only vendors. He settled on thinking as he moved on. The next vendor in his line of sight was a man selling yakitori and by this point, Izuku's stomach was close to eating itself. He was starved. He knew he was drooling this time as he licked his lips while staring at the yakitori lining the display. Okay, new plan. I'm cute. Cats are cute. So, I'll use that to my advantage. Yeah. His ear twitched before gave himself a shake. I got this. Izuku walked behind the yakitori stall to where the cook was. Then he started to rub needily against the man's leg. Food. He would mew in demand. Food. Please. He continued to mew in desperation. Beat it. The man snapped and nudged Izuku away with his foot. Izuku wasn't going to take this. Food. He looked at the man with the biggest and wettest eyes he could muster and then promptly got kicked in the rum. A theme at this point, Izuku was noticing. Go, pest. The man barked. Izuku bristled a little before huffing and looking at the chicken skewers. God, did it smell so good. Izuku put his paws on the stall and debated just trying to jump up to steal a skewer. I am no thief, cat or not. He backed off. Izuku started to walk down the street. He'll find someone else. A free train ride was something. Taking something from someone who needs the money is something else. He was better than petty thievery. But damn if he wasn't tempted. You really thought you could just suck up to the old geezer? Huh. Izuku stopped his walking and felt his ears tip back before twitching. Then his nose caught wind of a new scent. The scent of grime and dirty fur. Izuku then looked off towards the interconnecting alley. There, laying lackadaisically on a dumpster, was a calico. This calico was mostly white in color, save for her face and back. She had a black blob of fur over her pale yellow right eye. Next to her left eye was orange tabby patch and the patches of black and orange would follow down her back in big spots save for the back of her head where it looked like the black and orange intermeshed. 
Every orange spot on her had lighter colored stripes hidden inside of them. Izuku looked around before looking back at her. Were you just talking to me? He asked rather dumbly and the calico shook her head. No, I was simply talking to the dumpster beside you, you dumb kid. Yes, I was talking to you. She quipped before laying her head down on her paws. You can understand me. Oh my gosh. Goodness, I can see you aren't the smartest in the litter. Are you? What are you? Someone's pet that got lost. She inquired and Izuku started to pad up to her with an eagerness in his step. Her ears went back a little when he stopped in front of the dumpster. Izuku felt his ears flick a little before he shook his head. I think even if I tell her the truth, she'd never believe me. He rationalized and then locked eyes with the cat. I'm Izuku. You, Izuku, you really are a lost pet with a name like that. Just call me Angel if you must. Angel, I'll remember that. Angel stretched her front paws out before jumping down from the dumpster with ease so she was standing next to Izuku. This whole time, Izuku figured he was normal-sized for a cat. But now he was starting to realize just why Angel was calling him a kit. She was tall and him dot 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 not so much. Do I really look like a kitten? He asked himself while looking at his paws. He wiggled his toes for a moment before looking up at Angel. Angel snorted. Yep, that confirms it. A simple house pet you are. Let me guess. No experience out in the streets, huh? No. He admitted shamefully while lowering his ears and eyes all the same. His shoulders sagged and he thought of a story on the spot. My owners moved and left me behind. Angel softly hissed at this. Uh, a present once left. She walked up to him and he got to see that her tail wasn't white, like her belly and underside. Her tail was completely intermeshed with black and orange respectfully her fur was also long. Not Maine Coon long and not Izuku's own long fur, but long enough to where it was clearly starting to mat in places. I know that feeling personally. Her ears went back as she stared down at Izuku. I will say, your fur color is rather interesting. Never seen another cat like you. I feel like you'd be prized with such a rare color. Oh well, it just goes to show that humans don't deserve us, fine creatures. Alright Kit, listen up. She batted his nose with her long tail. Izuku stood at attention immediately. Your first mistake was going to the humans who cook on the streets. They've grown wise to cats like us and they know if they feed us, two more will show up looking for food. No, stay away from them from now on. Angel demanded and started to walk down the alley. Fair enough. I guess I was just letting my stomach do the talking. Izuku explained while following her down the alley. Most do. That's how they get hurt. Learn it from me. Stay away from the roads, especially at night. Humans are cruel and reckless. Now, you want food, correct? Yes, I'm starved. Please tell me you have some to share. Huh? No, you need to know who to look for. You see the vendors are greedy with their food. They aren't just going to hand it over as I said. They know not to give us food as others will want food. No, you need to find someone who wants to feed you, or you hunt for food yourself. I don't know how to hunt, nor do I think I want to. Another shudder ran through his body at the idea of chomping into a still squirming mouse. Just tell me you're spoiled and spare the long verses. Angel lightly snapped, and get out of that mindset or find a new home. You won't survive these streets otherwise. Now, I can do one of two things for you. I can teach you how to hunt to give you a fighting chance, or I can point you in the direction of a human who may be willing to feed you. I will not do both. Izuku's stomach rumbled loudly. So, it's up to me. I can hunt or I can have someone help me. He allowed his eyes to shut while he mused on the two ideas. I'm a cat now, and, as much as I hate it, I'm homeless. As much as I want her to just point me towards the nearest human willing to give me some food I know it's not something I can rely on forever. As much as I hate the idea, I have to do it. I need to learn to be a cat. Not act like a human or have those human needs because I'm not human. Not anymore. He turned to Angel and nodded. Please, teach me. Angel's tail lightly twitched. Seems you're not so hopeless after all, Kit. Follow me. I know the perfect place for rats. Izuku tried to not make a face. Though he couldn't help his less than enthusiastic tone when said, lead the way. Well, next thing Izuku knew he was running for his life after her. Angel's long legs made her look graceful as she ran down the alley. Her body was long and slim and her moves were effortless as she ran and then jumped on some trash cans with ease. She then jumped onto a nearby fire escape. Izuku ran right behind her trying, hoping, begging, that he looked as effortless as she was. Until he got to the trash cans that were. He skidded to a stop and looked at how tall they were compared to him. Come on, house pet. The rats aren't going to wait. Her voice encouraged, reverberating and echoing around the alley. Izuku puffed his chest out and backed up a few quick steps. He crouched down low and felt his whole body wiggle as he stared at the two glinting metal trash cans before him. Izuku then took off running for the cans and he leaped. High into the air, he flew and he landed just too far off causing both cans to clatter loudly while they tumbled to the ground, nearly smacking him in the process. The loud sound caused Izuku to scramble away for the nearest place of cover, behind a dumpster. He heard Angel sigh a sigh deep from her soul before approaching him. Maybe you are helpless, Kit. She poked her nose from behind the dumpster. 
and I can't believe you're making me do this. It what before he could finish his question the back of his neck was snatched and Izuku went limp. Angel then hoisted him up by his scruff with ease. His legs curled on instinct and soon Angel was off running again. Just know, this is the only time I'm doing this for you. Next time you're finding your own way. Angel huffed, her mouth sounding full, as it was. Angel then jumped up, using another set of trash cans to jump onto the same fire escape, just on a different side. Then, she dropped him. Oof. Izuku gasped as he fell onto his, already sore, rump. In here. Humans don't live here, but the rats do. Angel jumped onto a windowsill with ease and disappeared on the other side just as quickly. Izuku got down, wiggled himself, and jumped. Thankfully the window ledge was much easier to get up onto this time. He jumped inside of the place and looked around. Izuku blinked, rubbed his eyes with his paws, and looked again. No, his eyes weren't deceiving him. He saw toys, desks, and chairs. Is this building a school? He saw the main desk and a whiteboard. But the place was vacant like it had to be abandoned in a hurry. Toys were left where they lay, chairs untucked, and even the teacher's desk was untouched where papers lay strewn about. What happened here? Dunno. Don't care. Just know that this is the perfect hunting ground for beginners like you. The rats are fat and juicy. They eat what was left over from the humans. I even saw one eating the walls once. That was an easy kill for me. Izuku hummed as he and Angel started to pass by the abandoned toys. Toys, this was at least a daycare. He mused. If not a daycare then it had to be a grade 1 classroom. Angel stopped suddenly, making Izuku stop all the same. Her tail twitched and she crouched low to the ground. He knew immediately to hang back and just observe her in action. It was like she was gliding on the tips of her toes. Her ears went forward while she moved to make absolutely no sound. Then, she paused while looking under a desk, and Izuku's vision was blocked by a toy. Angel pounced, her whole body propelling forward like a spring-loaded toy. There was a scream and Izuku watched as a plump white rat scurried away. Izuku's body went low as his eyes trained on the rat running away from Angel. Angel pounced again and this time she grabbed the rat. She didn't snap its neck instantly. No, she started to shake it vigorously until there was an audible snap and the rat went completely still. Then, she dropped the thing. Your turn, house pet. She dropped to the ground and started to instantly eat. Izuku cringed a little at the sound of her tearing into the rat's flesh, but then came the smell. By God, it smelt. It smelt good. Izuku licked his lips hungrily and he dared to get just a bit closer to sniff it he was met with an angry bat to the face by Angel's paw. Get your own, she hissed. Izuku grumbled while walking away. To let her have her meal in peace, he flicked his ears while focusing on the area around them. I first need to focus on my hearing, listen for anything that may signal life. So, he listened. He listened so hard that he could hear the blood rushing through his body. At first, he feared that he was doing something wrong as he heard nothing. He felt his ears twitch and turn every which way like little sonars, but he heard nothing. Then, off in the farthest corner of the room, Izuku heard soft movements, the sound of something burrowing. Izuku went down low, so low that he felt his stomach touch the ground below. He copied Angel, doing his best to stay on his toes and not to make a sound as he got closer and closer to the sound. The closer he got the more he heard. He heard the occasional squeak from the creature he was hunting. There it was, behind a fallen chair nibbling on the wood, fat and white with beady red eyes. Izuku could practically taste it the rat raised its head in the air and then took off running with no warning. Oh no, you don't. Izuku gave chase immediately and the two were in a race, one for its life and one for breakfast. Izuku leaped and jumped in front of the rat. The rat twisted and tried to run the opposite way. Izuku leapt that way as well and then, with no mercy, he raised his paw up and swiped. He caught the rat directly in the side causing the creature to fall to its side. The rat screamed and tried to scramble away, but Izuku wasn't going to let it. No, he jumped and grabbed the rat by its neck with his mouth and he squeezed. Izuku felt something pop between his teeth before the white rat went completely still. Hey, not bad, Kit. You caught your first one. I know cats that can't even catch one, let alone the first one they see. Angel stretched out lazily and Izuku dropped the rat and licked his lips. He could taste the blood between his teeth and it tasted god it tasted so good. Before he knew it, he was digging in. If he didn't think about and he let his humanity fall to the back of his mind, then he was good. When there was nothing but clean bones left of the rat then, and only then, was Izuku satisfied. How does the first kill feel? House pet, think you can take the streets. I think Izuku rolled beside her lazily. Once I get jumping down, then I'll be able to take the streets. But Angel scoffed a little. No kid is good at jumping. It takes everyone some time to get used to. You'll learn that in your own time. They fell into a relative silence and Izuku watched her as she started to clean between her paw pads. He watched her movements and looked at his own pads. Soon, she was giving herself an impromptu bath and he just watched her. He almost felt embarrassed doing so. It was like watching in the bathtub. But cats were different than humans. Cats didn't care about being watched while they groomed themselves. Before he knew it he was mimicking her. 
He licked at his own fur the way she was. It was weird. But again, if he just put his humanity to the back of his mind and just lost the ability to think like a human then it wasn't so bad. Humans didn't care if he did this. Humans didn't care if he, a cat, licked at his privates. It wasn't like there was a human around anyways. Alright, Kit. You ready? Angel asked suddenly, making Izuku look at her in mild alarm. Ready? He asked and she nodded. I'm leaving. Are you ready to be on your own? You've proven you can hunt and I have faith that you'll be well of from here. Oh, his ears went down as his tail thumped sadly against the ground. Come on, you didn't think I'd hold you by your scruff forever did you? No, I knew you wouldn't. Maybe we can stay together. He asked while his ears perked right back up. You don't have to hold my scuff. No kit. She shook her head. I work alone. I don't need company. Oh, he repeated his earlier statement with the same amount of saddened emotion. That's right. Cats, while can work well in pairs, don't always like the company of other cats. He was reminded that some cats just work well alone. However, before I leave let me give you one last piece of advice, come here. Angel walked up to the open window and jumped on the ledge. Izuku followed her with some ease, but still nearly overshooting the jump. She pointed with her nose toward the east of where they were looking. Izuku saw that there was a small apartment complex not even a story high. It was run down and looked like it was in a not-so-safe area. Over there, there's a human. They'll feed you. I've been to them many times in the winter where the rats are scarce. He's nice. I thought you weren't going to do both. Izuku mused with a knowing purr leaving his throat. HMPH, you've proven you're willing to help yourself, even if you are still just a helpless kit. Now, I have to go. Places to be and areas too. Who knows, maybe we'll pass one another again someday. Goodbye, Angel. Angel jumped down from the window and onto the trash cans below. Izuku watched her move effortlessly through the alley until she was soon out of sight. Gone in the darkness. I'll see her again. I know it. He thought with a positive knowing. He looked out towards the apartments where she pointed him and he nodded to himself. Okay, I guess I have somewhere I can go if times get rough. He decided and looked down at the trash cans below. Izuku shut his eyes and then he leapt from the ledge. He was weightless as he flew through the air for only a moment. Then he landed on the trash cans. The cans moved but didn't tip over and he landed feet first. Who was the noise he made while stilling himself so the cans wouldn't fall over? I did it. Once the cans were completely still Izuku beamed at himself. Awesome. Then he jumped down from those and landed on the ground. When all four paws were on the ground, Izuku took off in a run towards the shady apartment complexes. While he wasn't hungry, he wanted to be sure he knew who to look for and just where to go exactly. Well, the area he needed to be at wasn't hard to find as there were cats everywhere. Izuku didn't think much about it as he just started to walk. There were cats laying on the dumpsters, others on the ground. Some were play fighting with one another and the others were just lazying about. Hey, we got a newcomer. Someone shouted and Izuku looked at the cat that shouted. Just a simple black cat with orange eyes. They were fully grown and lithe in their appearance. They had long spindly legs that looked like they break if a strong gust of wind blew by him. The cat jumped down to greet him. Oh, he's a youngin. Looks like it. Poor thing, were you abandoned? A brown tabby with dark brown stripes and white paws came up next to Izuku. Look at him, Brian, he can't be older than six weeks. She tried to whisper to the black cat. Brian, but failed as Izuku heard every word. Seems so. Let me guess, Angel sent you this way. Brian asked as he gently tapped Izuku's shoulder with his long and thin tail. Izuku nodded. Yeah, he whispered. Ah, well, welcome to our little paradise. Don't worry, we're friendly. We're not like those alicats. You can call me Brian and that's Adali. I Izuku. He whispered a little while walking between the two of them. Are yo you all here because of the human that feeds you? Oh yeah, they're great. Adelie purred and stretched her front paws out before yawning. They love us always nice. Don't worry, sweetie, we've all been like you. Abandoned and the human knows this. They came up to the apartment and Izuku noticed something odd about the place. The windows were busted in, for starters, and a lot of the windows were dark and safe for one. He narrowed his eyes at this. This place has also been abandoned. He mused. Oh, here he comes. Brian perked up and so did several others. Izuku watched as several of the cats all flocked around this one human. This human, a boy, was no older than Izuku when Izuku died. Clearly only 13 years of age. But that's not what made Izuku frown. For starters this human had a small little 5 pound of cat food in his arms. Despite the fact that the human was so skinny that it looked like a harsh breeze would tip him over. His purple hair was sticking up like it was underwater and it was oily, like he hadn't bathed in a good while. His pale skin was sickly looking, with Izuku able to make out his green veins just under the skin. His skin was also grimy at the same time. But that's not what made Izuku start to bristle. It was the muzzle that was fastened tightly around the boy's mouth. The eye bags. The fact that this boy looked like he hadn't eaten in days. The boy and him locked eyes. Izuku looked into his indigo eyes and he looked into Izuku's. The boy said nothing, because he couldn't speak, and simply crouched down and extended his hand for Izuku to sniff. 
Izuku did, and suddenly he was being scratched under the chin. The boy put the cat food down and crouched down. All of the cats started to swarm him. There were easily over 20 cats and kittens alike who rubbed needily against this boy. They flocked to him, they clearly depended on him to survive. But Izuku knew just by looking at this boy that he wasn't going to be alive much longer. Not with that muzzle blocking his only way of food. That thing on his face is weird, but he's nice, Adelie stated fondly. If not for him we all surely would have died this winter. Izuku narrowed his eyes and started to approach but stopped. They all stopped and visibly jumped when a grating voice shouted through the ally. Itoshi, Itoshi Shinsu, you get your ass back here. Nearly all of the cats scrambled when footsteps started stomping this way. They rushed away to hiding. Some hid in the abandoned apartment building while others chose to just flee the area. All but Izuku. Izuku was the only one standing. Itoshi, the boy, also scrambled. He scrambled to hide the bag of cat food. He settled on throwing the bag into a nearby trash can. A man came into view and Hitoshi silently only put his hands up in front of him as if to block an oncoming blow. Izuku quickly stepped to the side and hid behind the very trash can Hitoshi threw the food into. This man, whom Izuku didn't care for at all, snatched Hitoshi by his wrist and yanked him forward. Hitoshi let out a pain noise when the man squeezed his wrists harshly. Izuku felt himself start to bristle and puff up. There was a moment as they just stared at one another. Move your ass, boy. You got the neighbors asking questions about the muzzle. He pushed Hitoshi forward in a jerking motion. If you behave maybe we'll discuss letting the muzzle off for dinner. Maybe, yeah. After hearing that, Izuku's mind was made up and he crouched low. A new prey in his line of sight. After all, a rat's a rat. No matter the look or size. Izuku narrowed his eyes as he looked at the house. It was a little shack of a home. Not even a story tall wedged between two other homes that were bigger than it. It was one of those homes that Izuku wouldn't even think to look at if he were passing it by the street. He saw Hitoshi and the man walk inside, so he knew he had the right house. The question now is, how do I get inside? Izuku didn't really know why he was doing this. He only met Hitoshi for five seconds before he was snatched and taken away. Yet, Izuku knew. He knew he had to help Hitoshi. Even if he was a cat now, he was going to help this boy and his mind was made up. Izuku padded across the tiny lawn, silently wedged himself in the tiny space between both houses, and looked up at the window with a light still on. He couldn't see inside the window from where he was standing. Window ledges. Why do I feel like I'm going to run into a lot of these? He thought while staring up at the window ledge. His tail twitched and he backed up as far as he could get next to the other house. Then he charged forward and leaped up onto the window ledge. He pressed his nose against the cool glass to get a better look at the inside. It was a tiny kitchen with no stove, but it did have a microwave and on the tiny countertop was a portable stove top that was currently plugged in where the man from earlier was cooking a pot of boiling water beside him was a box of noodles. The boy, Hitoshi, was sitting at the teeny dinner table for two. His head was hanging down and Izuku could see that he still had that muzzle on. It made Izuku's fur bristle up. The man spoke to the boy and with his sharpened hearing, Izuku was able to make out what was being said by the man. You're lucky I took you in, boy. They wanted to put you in the system. You know that, right? The man sneered in Hitoshi's direction while waving a wooden spoon threateningly in Hitoshi's direction. Hitoshi ducked his head down shamefully, fearful of being hit. When the man waved the spoon just a little too aggressively towards Hitoshi the boy even put his hands up as if to try and deflect the blow coming his way. Izuku's eyes narrowed and a growl arose from his throat. Maybe I should have let them take you. Put you in a home where you'll live out of garbage bags like the rest of the unwanted children. But no, I give you a room, a roof over your head, and warm food in your stomach. The man continued to berate and sneer at Itoshi as if the boy had personally wronged him. After all, it's what my brother would have wanted, may he rest in peace. A heavy sigh left the man's mouth now and he went back to stirring the water before finally adding the noodles. And what do you do to reward me for all I've done for you? You steal from the local stores to feed the fucking cats. I can't trust you. I just can't. When the man's voice rose in his irate anger, Hitoshi started to shrink in on himself. Yet, despite the obvious fear that was etched on Hitoshi's face he was shaking his head vigorously. Don't you lie to me. This man's temper went from zero to a hundred real quick. Hell, even Izuku jumped at the sudden tonal change. I know you've been stealing from that fucking pet store. How else do you keep getting your greedy little hands on all that cat food? The man then smacked the spoon against the countertop with an angry thwack. That cracked through the air like a whip and made Hitoshi flinch again. His eyes were wide and fearful as he raised his hands to wave them frantically in front of him, as well as panic-sounding noises leaving his mouth. The man's mouth twisted in rage as he tightened his grip on the wooden spoon. Clearly you haven't learned your lesson. Itoshi literally fell out of his chair and kept his arms out in front of him. Scared muffled screaming was suddenly heard while he tried to quickly back away. Izuku patted his paws against the window in immediate desperation. But the window was a push-up window not a push-in, meaning there was no way he could get in. 
So, Izuku jumped down without even thinking about it and quickly searched for a way. He ran around the tiny house feeling like every second he was wasting time as every second lasted for an hour as he desperately tried to find a way inside the house. Hearing every muffled scream of pain and fear made Izuku's heart race faster and faster. Izuku would finally find an opening, a little cellar window that wasn't locked and pushed inwards. He pushed himself through with his head and down he fell into the cold and damp cellar. The first thing Izuku smelt was mold and mildew alike. There, in the center of the cellar rested a threadbare blanket on top of a dingy little cot. Izuku noted the few hero comics laying by the bed. The comics were worn and faded. One, an All Might comic book, was falling apart at the spine with several pages loosely hanging off. The whole place was dark with the only light being a singular light bulb above Izuku's head. There wasn't a string. If Izuku had to guess he would theorize that the light switch to this bulb was on the outside of the cellar. Up the steps. The long amount of steps led to a cracked open door. Izuku looked up at the staircase. The stairs were wooden with big gaps between them. No backing. Izuku quickly clambered up the steps in quick succession. He pushed the door open and looked around the area quickly. He was looking at a hallway and his ears perked at the sound of Hitoshi's cries and his fur rose in an angry bristle. Izuku's teeth gnashed in anger and he quickly took off in a run down towards the tiny kitchen. He didn't even think twice about what he was doing. The man was above Hitoshi, a wooden spoon clutched tightly in his hand. Hitoshi was curled up on himself just trying his hardest to protect his head. Izuku charged just as the man rose his hand to strike a cowering Hitoshi. He jumped and wrapped his body around the man's arm. He felt his sharp claws sink into the man's flesh and only seconds later Izuku would bite into Hitoshi's uncle's arm just the same. He did what many many cats have done to him when he was human. He started to bunny kick, making sure to use his claws. Hitoshi's uncle let out a shriek of pain as his attention went away from Hitoshi. Run, please, Izuku thought while looking into Hitoshi's scared eyes. The boy peeked at him through his arms in alarm and shock. Izuku's scruff was grabbed and the man tried to yank him off. Izuku wasn't going to to go lightly and he dug his claws in deeper, which was saying something as the man's arm was starting to look like bloody flesh ribbons. The blood actually started to stain the fur around Izuku's paws. The stranger yanked Izuku's scruff hard and Izuku was forced to let go. Next thing he knew he was flying through the air that was until he hit a wall full force. Izuku yelped as his head felt like was on the verge of exploding. Stars danced lazily around his vision just the same. You snuck a fucking cat in my house. The person's voice sounded far away, but it was still coming in clear despite the fact that Izuku's hearing sounded like he was underwater. He slowly lifted his head up and was a little shocked to find himself inside the kitchen sink. He shakily lifted his head up to see Hitoshi on his hands and knees trying his hardest to get away from his uncle. However, the man was quicker and snatched Hitoshi by his hair he was unforgiving when he pulled Hitoshi up. A muffled scream left Hitoshi's mouth and he reached up to grab his uncle's wrist to get his uncle to let go. You ungrateful brat. You know how I feel about cats. It's not bad enough that you're feeding those strays, but you just had to take one home. Tears fell from Hitoshi's eyes as he still shook his head while he never let go of his uncle's wrist, still telling the truth despite knowing that his uncle wouldn't believe him. Clearly, I can't trust you. Maybe a few days locked in the cellar will teach you. The man twisted Hitoshi's hair in his grip so it was easy for him to start dragging the boy across the floor. Hitoshi screamed. His wails sounded pain-filled as he kicked his legs against the ground and tried to claw at his uncle's grip. Izuku was out of the sink in seconds. His body was on autopilot, charging through the kitchen and ignoring the throbbing pain radiating through his head and body. He didn't even think when he jumped on the kitchen table from the floor. Once on the table, he was high enough to jump onto the uncle's back with a yowl from hell. The man dropped Hitoshi the moment Izuku started to claw at him, claw at the side of his neck. A lot of people just forget how dangerous cats can truly be and it was time to remind this man. Opening his mouth as wide as it could go, he sank his fangs deep into the man's neck. There was a roar of pain from the man and he quickly scrambled to get Izuku off of him, going as far as to try and scramble away from Hitoshi. At first, Izuku thought the uncle was just trying to get Izuku off of him, and in a way he was right. The man did move so he could get Izuku off of him, but in a way that Izuku could never expect. First Izuku was ripped off of the man's neck. But before Izuku could spring back and start spitting and scratching some more, he was suddenly slammed against the small countertop. All of the wind was knocked clean out of Izuku's tiny lungs. He couldn't breathe, he couldn't move, his whole mind becoming dazed from the attack. By the time he heard the sound of a drawer opening it was too late. It felt like he was set ablaze when something was shoved through his body. Izuku yowled in pain and with a shaking head and dwindling strength he could only stare at the knife that was keeping him pinned to the countertop. It was a butcher's knife easily eight inches in length. And the man ripped the knife out of him. Let's see you get back up after that. He sneered in Izuku's direction. Well, he was right. 
Izuku couldn't move. That knife had torn clean through his side and cut through several of his organs. All Izuku could really do was just lay there in his final moments. He just stared in horror as Itoshi had tried to escape during the commotion. He had tried to flee out of the front door, but he hadn't gotten far. No, as the edges of Izuku's vision started to darken he saw Hitoshi being dragged back kicking and screaming the whole time. Wow, I think this was shorter than my last life. Hitoshi, you seemed sweet and I'm sorry. Maybe in my next life, we could be friends. He wondered, his vision blurring along with slowly getting darker and darker. Then, Izuku was sure he died on that countertop with one last pitiful mewling noise leaving him like a call into the night. Izuku then woke up. Let's repeat that, Izuku. Woke. Up. He was still a cat. He was still on that countertop surrounded and soaked in his own blood that had dripped and splattered on the floor creating a sickly red puddle down below. A puddle that Izuku had to jump into. A puddle that went splash when all four of his paws made contact with it. I don't understand. He looked at himself in the dark puddle. He looked the same. From what he could gather, his fur was still a dark green and super thick, only now it was blood smeared and splattered. I died. I know I died. He thought with narrowed eyes. He stared at his reflection for a lot longer than he should have. He tried to make it make sense in his mind. But at the moment his mind just couldn't until it clicked. You've got to be kidding me. I have a quirk. God really said, I got you, fam. In the sickest way they possibly could. They didn't give Izuku a quirk when he was human but instead decided to give Izuku a quirk now that he was a cat. A non-human. The question is, is it a healing quirk? Or is it something more powerful? Because I know I died. I know I did. Izuku knew that quirked animals were rare. Rarer than sentient quirks. Okay. He accepted this. He had no choice. Besides, now that he knew he had this quirk, this gift that he wasn't allowed to have in his past life, he wasn't going to let this go to waste. I have a boy to save no I have to save my boy. He knew the moment he saw Hitoshi. That's why he was doing this. Hitoshi was his owner and nobody else could live up to that mantle. Izuku padded away from the pile of blood, his footprints making perfect little kitten paw prints behind him. When he walked down the small hallway he picked up on the noise of a TV playing obnoxiously loud. It sounded like an American movie was playing if the English he was hearing were telling him anything. Izuku silently walked past the cellar door and over to where the sound of the TV was playing. It was coming from the room at the very end of the hallway. He used his paw to gently push the unlocked door open and it silently did so with ease. It was a bedroom. It was Hitoshi's uncle's bedroom. The man lazily snored away while the movie played on full blast. The room was dark and safe with the TV casing and ever-changing glow around the room. There was a window just above the man's bed and that was when Izuku saw it was dark out. But it was midday when I fought him. He didn't want to drone on that for too much longer. No, he had to save Hitoshi. And with the uncle asleep he felt that it might actually be easy. However, he would soon hit his first official snag when he approached the cellar door. It was locked, because of course it was. However, he noticed that there were no extra locks. No padlocks that would require a human to unlock. No, the door was just simply locked on this side, meaning the door can easily be unlocked on the other side. He figured. Izuku's tail gave a twitch and he searched around for where the key could possibly be. First, he searched the kitchen for a key rack, but there was no such luck. Bastard probably keeps it on him. He realized a huff of agitation leaving his nose. Fair enough, Izuku was going to have to work for Hitoshi's safety and well-being. So back to the man's bedroom he went. The best thing about being a cat, in his opinion, was the fact that he was silent. No footsteps were to be heard as he walked along the carpeted floor with confidence. He gave the darkened room a quick sweep around. It was so easy, even when there was very little light, or even when the TV screen went dark, Izuku could still see with relative ease. He kept his eyes out for keys, a ring of keys or even just a singular key. He didn't care, he just needed the key he was looking for and he would find keys eventually. He would find the keys on a keyring shoved inside a tool belt, but his logic took over fairly quickly. A key to the cellar would not be on this key ring. For starters, this is a tool belt and these keys all look like they belong to a building maintenance worker. No, I don't think this is it. He shook his head and then looked up at the bed. Okay, again, Izuku just didn't think about it. He didn't try to rationalize it in his mind. He just simply jumped from the floor and onto the bed. Now, he did have to use his claws to help scale his way up the mattress when he was just a little short on the jump, but he was getting better. The uncle never woke or even stirred when Izuku was fully up top the mattress. Bingo. Izuku spotted the key. He knew this had to be the cellar door key because it was sticking out of the man's shirt pocket, meaning he probably keeps it close to him all day. But now came the real problem, taking the key out of the pocket without waking the man. Okay, this man is sleeping. It looks like he's in a deep sleep meaning I have a good chance at getting close without waking him. But one wrong mover knows and he could easily wake back up. A rat is a rat. I'm hunting and that key is my prey. Izuku steeled himself quickly and got down low on his stomach. He was a hunter and it was time for him to go in for the kill. Itoshi laid on his cot. 
His body ached from all the new bruises he had received. Where were these bruises? Too many to truly count. All under his clothes. That much he knew. He was sure his uncle had bruised one of Hitoshi's ribs when he chucked the boy down the steps of the cellar. Hitoshi tried this time. God did he try. He wanted to be good. He promised himself he wasn't going to run away. But now here he was. Back in the cellar. That cat. His mind kept replaying to that green cat. That cat with the pretty green fur and white whiskers. The newbie from what he gathered. The pretty kitten that Hitoshi would have picked up and held close if not for his uncle catching him at the wrong time. The cat that his uncle slaughtered on the kitchen countertop. It made Hitoshi want to cry as his mind refused to stop playing with those painful yowls the kitten was screaming in his dying moment. Hitoshi knew that kitten was trying to get him out of there and so he tried to take the chance but dot 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 it didn't work. I am no thief. Why can't Uncle Ju believe me? Uncle Ju always hated Hitoshi. He hated the fact that he was the one having to take care of him after Hitoshi's father, Toma, passed away. Uncle Ju hated Hitoshi's quirk because it was almost the exact same quirk Toma had, only Hitoshi's was stronger. Uncle Ju hated that Hitoshi looked almost identical to his dead brother and there was nothing Hitoshi could do to fix it. No matter what he did it always made Uncle Ju mad. Sit still and quiet. Hitoshi was considered rude for not speaking. Try to speak. Hitoshi was trying to use his quirk on Ju. Cook dinner. The food either sucks or is poisoned. Don't cook dinner. An ungrateful brat wouldn't help him after a long day of work. Hitoshi could never win. Ever. Then came the muzzle. I know you're going to brainwash me to try and get away, boy. I'm three steps ahead of you. Always. Hitoshi was sure he was going to die wearing this stupid muzzle. It was only ever taken off when Uncle Ju felt like it. He even convinced Hitoshi's teachers that he must keep it on because of his dangerous quirk. The teachers agreed and nobody batted an eye. Not even when Hitoshi was clearly rail thin, malnourished, and not able to eat lunch at school. Nobody cared. Nobody ever cared. Maybe when I get out again I'll just find the tallest building I can just do everyone a favor and jump. He thought while hot tears fell from his eyes and a sob racked his body. No, the cats. Nobody will be around to feed the cats. A small voice in his head told him this. It's true. Those cats relied on him to eat. Hitoshi Shinsu was no thief. He never stole food from the pet stores. He took clean and dry pet kibble out of the dumpster. Pet kibble that could still be used that wasn't moldy or too expired. Food that was just going to land in a landfill. Those cats, Brian and Natalie alike, needed him. He couldn't kill himself when they would likely starve in the winter without him. If he couldn't feed himself then he could at least feed the cats. Thwish, thwish, thwish. Hitoshi blinked at the noise. It sounded like. His brow rose to meet his hairline for a moment as he painstakingly peeled himself from the cot. His bruises all lit up in pain at the sudden movement but he pushed past it as he walked up to the end of the stairs. He pressed a hand against the rib that was starting to hurt the most, going from a dull throb to a more stabbing pain. With his free hand, he put it on the railing to the stairs. He held his breath while waiting to make sure he wasn't just hearing things. That his Uncle Ju hadn't caused him some sort of brain injury. Thwish, thwish, thwish. He had heard it right. Slowly, Hitoshi started up the stairs. He knew to be mindful of the third step to the bottom as that one squeaked. His rib was burning more intensely with each step he took but he just kept pushing through it until he got to the top step. Hitoshi went down low and tried to look at the crack under the door. All he could see was a shadow, but no features. MPH was the only noise he could make with the muzzle wrapped tightly around his head. He nearly fell back when the key to the door was pushed under the crack. No way, he thought. He must be hallucinating. He hit his head too hard on the concrete. That stupid spoon caused him to have some sort of brain injury. He touched the key. It felt so real. The metal was cold to the touch but slightly wet along the smooth side. Hitoshi's whole body started to shake as for the first time since he was seven he felt his hopes rise. Hitoshi looked at the keyhole and pressed the tip of the key against it. He didn't push the key in. Not yet, he was afraid. Afraid that this was just his uncle playing a cruel trick on him. Have him get his hopes up and then stomp on them. He exhaled a slow breath through his nose and pushed. The key slid into the lock perfectly. Hitoshi rotated the key and his heart could have given out then and there when he heard the sound of the lock clicking open. He felt his body go numb with excitement as his heart continued to race faster and faster. He took the key out and twisted the knob of the door. The door creaked open slowly and Hitoshi looked down at his savior. The green cat that he had seen die only hours before. The cat looked at him and he looked at the cat. Slowly, Hitoshi turned and looked around the hallway. His uncle's door was shut his TV blasting loudly. A nightly ritual. Then he looked back down at the cat. Hitoshi slowly got down on his knees and the cat needed no further prompting. He jumped onto Hitoshi's shoulder with little to no effort. First, the cat rubbed against his face with a loud purr vibrating through his whole tiny body. But then, the cat latched onto the strap on Hitoshi's muzzle. The muzzle itself wasn't anything fancy or expensive. That wasn't Ju's style. In fact, Ju himself made this muzzle. It was a metal bar that Hitoshi was forced to bite. 
The bar had two leather straps that would clasp behind Hitoshi's head. Behind these straps was a padlock that Hitoshi couldn't undo without a key. Well, a key meant nothing when there was a sharp-toothed animal around. This cat is quirked, clearly. I never thought I'd see one for myself. I mean I heard stories but, this green cat made quick work of gnawing on the leather. This is the smartest cat I've ever seen. The left side of the muzzle snapped with ease and Hitoshi no longer needed the padlock as he simply reached up and removed the muzzle himself. It fell with ease and Hitoshi inhaled sharply. His lips were dry and cracked, and his tongue was no different. He looked at the green cat and the cat purred again before rubbing his face against Hitoshi. Hitoshi was awed and amazed. At that moment both Izuku and Hitoshi had one singular thought. This cat, this boy, is mine. Hitoshi threw the backpack over his shoulder. It was his uncle's backpack that he had found hidden away in a hallway closet. Inside the backpack was his uncle's portable stovetop burner and a single pan from the kitchen. He had no clothes, but that's fine for now. He was just glad to be away from that hellhole. He did stock up on bottled water and even some canned goods his uncle had stashed away. He took one last look at the home and took a swig from the water bottle. Are you ready? His voice was dry and hoarse from lack of use, but it should get better as time goes on. The cat mewed on his shoulder and Hitoshi started walking down the sidewalk. So, I was thinking, you're going to need a name. The cat mewed while walking across from Hitoshi's shoulder to the other shoulder. It seemed they were in agreement good. I already thought of one for you. How does Moss sound? A soft MRPH left the cat's mouth. Yes, Moss. Hitoshi reached up and scratched the cat behind the ears while relishing in his newfound freedom. They locked eye and Hitoshi swore he saw the cat nod. Okay, Moss, it is. It's you and me, Moss. Well, you, me, and the other cats I still have to feed. He heard a sound leave Moss's mouth and Hitoshi wasn't entirely sure, but it sounded like a laugh. It made him smile. A new chapter was opening up for him. Hopefully a better one. It took a while, but he and Moss worked together to find the perfect spot, and what a spot it was. It was a decent length away from Hitoshi's uncle, and Moss was the one to find it. An abandoned school. The building was one of the smaller high schools, just hardly two stories high. The white paint was peeling on the outside while Ivy was eating the exterior all the same. But its roof was intact and so were its walls. It also had more than enough rooms for them and the cats if it came down to it. Easily over 20 or 30, plus a gym and cafeteria. The building was unlocked and Hitoshi gave the area a quick look around. He then stepped inside. I think I know about this place. He told Moss as the cat padded ahead of him. This was once a high school. He spoke low into a whisper. I think it shut down for the same reason it's sister elementary school that's closer to my uncle's house. But the gist is that there just weren't enough people to keep the schools up and going. Places like Yue, Shaiksu, and Sai were getting bigger and bigger while these schools started getting fewer and fewer students. Because this one is related to the grade school it also caused the other school to shut down as a result. I heard the day it was announced the teachers just up and left, leaving the students behind. But that's just the rumor I was told in middle school. They also say this place is cursed and if anyone who steps foot in here will die a horrible death. Though he made the wiggling fingers at Moss near the end and Moss snorted before continuing on. Moss turned and looked at Itoshi with a bit of interest behind those big emerald eyes. Yeah dot 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 man, this place was gutted, so, I'm guessing the last rumor was fake. He whispered while trying to look around to the best of his abilities. He had no flashlight or phone to help him in the darkened area. He did try the lights, but alas, they were off. Don't know why I thought that would work. Thankfully, there were plenty of windows, and seeing how it was the middle of the day it was easy to see where he was going despite the dark clouds that loomed over the sky this day. Walking inside they immediately looked down a long hallway where lots of rooms lined the wall. I'm glad this place is made with concrete and not wood. It probably would have dilapidated by now. Moss gave a mew in agreement as he walked beside Hitoshi. They were blessed that, despite the place being gutted of all of its belongings, and even some pipings in the wall, all of the rooms were open. Every classroom was the same size and completely barren. So, they moved on from the hallway and up the steps where the cafeteria was. It was spacious with a few remaining tables. Huh. Hitoshi walked up to the table and placed his backpack on the floor. Then he lay down on the table. It was a long table that could sit up to 20 people in a single sitting. More than long enough for his 5'6 body. This is better than the cot I was forced to sleep on. I could dig this. Moss jumped up next to Hitoshi and walked on Hitoshi's chest. Hitoshi winced a little at the pressure that Moss was putting behind his tiny murder mittens. Wump. Hitoshi coughed when Moss flopped down on his chest. Moss's thick fur now tickled the inside of his nose. Moss, the little shit, wiggled from side to side while on Hitoshi's chest. Hitoshi laughed and picked Moss up. Moss mewed in protest. Quit it. Hitoshi moved Moss around so he was now looking down on Hitoshi. 
Moss then pressed his paw against Hitoshi's lips. His paw pads were soft and those little razor blades hidden away and ready to pop out at a moment's notice. So, what do you think? Is this a good place for our new home? Hitoshi couldn't believe he was asking a cat this, but Moss wasn't just any cat. Hitoshi laid Moss back down on his chest and held the kitten close. Moss gave a soft meow and Hitoshi took it as a yes. Good, I like this place too. It's spacious and I just hope the other cats will know how to get to us. Then we have to worry about other things like food. As if on cue, Hitoshi's stomach rumbled. He hadn't eaten yet. He was trying to save his rations. He only had a few cans of food and he needed to make it last. I'm no thief. Of course, the things I stole from my uncle don't count. He's an asshole. Moss mewed in agreement. Good. Then we are in agreement. Hitoshi nodded, satisfied. First, a little nap, because I deserve it. And because I need to take my mind off of my hunger, then we'll worry about the other cats. Hitoshi stretched his body out before finally being able to fully relax and allow himself to sleep. He didn't sleep at all since escaping his uncle. He feared all night that his uncle was going to find him and drag him back. But for the first time he was finally able let his muscles unclench and just relax. He was out like a light before he even knew it, with Moss not too far behind him. Izuku Midoriya wasn't a thief, but he was dead and buried six feet in the ground with nothing to really show for it. Moss was Izuku Midoriya, but in a different way. It would leave him confused if he thought about it too much for too long. The main point to take away from this is simple. Izuku wasn't a thief, but Moss, Moss was a cat. And what's a cat without taking a few, erm, liberties? Yes, before Izuku told himself that he wasn't going to steal, that it was wrong, but this was different. Hitoshi was different. So, while Hitoshi slept peacefully on his newfound bed Izuku went out for a walk around their new living area. The best thing about the school was that it was rather secluded, as most schools had to be these days. It wasn't that long of a walk from the school's parking lot to the main area where all shops were located. How far did we walk away from his uncle's house? A mile. Two, three, it was hard to keep up with when he was this small. All he knew was that it was a safe enough distance. And with the high school being the way that it is he felt it was safe. Yet, Izuku's mind did wander to Itoshi's explanation of the school's shutdown. Then that means that the school angel took me to Mouse Hunt was the grade school he mentioned. It had to be. But that place wasn't gutted. Not like the high school. Everything just looked abandoned as stood. Bah, maybe I'm reading too much into it. Still, it was rather strange all around. Izuku got to the shopping district of this little area and found himself relatively disappointed. There was a small grocery store, which wasn't too bad of a find, but the other stores weren't much to him or to Hitoshi. There was an ice cream bar, but with no money, Hitoshi would get chased out. There was also a little clothing stall selling. What looked to be bootleg clothing of hero merch, including, but not limited to, a bootlegged endeavor called Effort that looked close enough to the original but had blonde hair instead of red and green eyes instead of blue. A bootlegged All Might called All Strength who wasn't even close to looking like All Might, with brown hair instead of blonde, purple eyes instead of blue, was muscular but in the wrong places and his smile was just creepy. No other words to describe it other than creepy. Izuku flicked his tail at this before strolling away from the clothing stall. Nope, it seemed the grocery store was his only salvation for now. The doors were automatic and motion detected, so with ease he was able to just walk in as he pleased. Nobody even noticed. At first, oh, poor thing must be lost. He heard a woman say once he was spotted, Look at that fur. The man commented to the same lady, I've never seen a green cat before. It's just a kitty. Maybe we should them home. I know Canny would love to have a kitten of her own. Especially one like that that cat would be an excellent show cat. He started to move on from where he was with a pep in his step. He was a cat on a mission. Izuku was surprised at how loud humans actually are when he, himself, is now a cat. When he was human, he had memories of trying to be quiet to sneak up slowly on an unsuspecting kitten or cat but with his new perspective he found out why he was often caught by the said cat. Humans were loud. Their footsteps were probably one of the loudest things about them. No matter how quiet they think they're being, their footsteps always rang out and vibrated around him like small shockwaves. The second loudest thing was their breathing and even, to some extent, their own beating hearts. Izuku heard the man's anxious breathing as he got down low to the ground probably so as not to startle Izuku with his giant stature. Kitty, here kitty. The man rubbed his fingers together while trying to get Izuku to come to him. P.S. 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 Izuku's ears went back as he sent a death glare to the man. Both the man and the woman almost seemed to internally freak out as they clammed up. That's kinda scary. Maybe we should leave this one alone. The man whispered and the woman agreed. Izuku continued on. Finally, he found what he was looking for. He looked at the chips in front of him. That's not something you see every day. Hey there, another man noticed Izuku. He had a smile on his face as he, like the previous man, crouched down. But he kept his distance. You're very pretty. He then started to beckon Izuku with his finger while he placed his shopping basket down. Izuku looked at this man. 
tall, but also well-built with a fine tone of muscle to show it. There was something familiar about this man that Izuku couldn't place. It made Izuku flick his ears back and forth while staring at this man. HM. Let's see. You're in luck hungry. The man, having no shame, opened a can of wet cat food right there in the shop and placed it down in front of Izuku. Izuku's pupils dilated as the delicious smell of wet cat food hit his nose in full force. His mouth salivated and he licked at his lips almost desperately. His body started to move towards the food on its own. He just had to have a taste it's a trap. Izuku managed to scramble back just as the man made his move and tried to snatch him. Fucking rude. Izuku's back arched and he was on his toes a deadly hiss left his mouth and before he knew it he was spitting as well as hissing. He hopped forwards as if to try and scare the man off before taking several hops away. His ears were flatted back against his head as he did his best to make himself bigger. Oh, you're spicy. And you're crusty. I like you. Leave me alone. This just made the man's smile grow as Izuku gave a warning growl. Alright, I'll take a hint. Good. Get. Izuku spat again and did a few hops towards him to get him going. Leave the food. The man continued to smile and it seemed like he understood what was requested as he did. In fact, leave the wet food for Izuku to enjoy. Oh, but this man wasn't done. Not by a long shot. Izuku didn't take his eyes off the man until he was out of the aisles. But Izuku would find himself surprised as this man wasn't like the others. This strangely familiar man was quiet, an expert in stealth, and Izuku was a fool for letting his gluttony nearly win. Izuku had gone back to the cat food and immediately started to dig in, licking the gravy and mystery meat up. Tuna? No. Liver? He tried to guess as he took big chunks from the can of food. A loud purr erupted from his throat as he happily ate. If it wasn't for him suddenly noticing a shadow casting over him, he might have been catnapped then and there. Izuku turned and looked up at the top of the aisle behind him where the man was now perched on, like a bird awaiting his prey, with a scarf in his hands. Because the scarf was in his hands Izuku was able to see the yellow goggles that rested around the man's neck. Oh shit, it's a racer hand. Izuku abandoned the food just in the nick of time as the scarf came flying at him. Damn it. A racer head cursed and Izuku heard him hop down and give chase. Get back here. Izuku snatched a bag of chips on his way out of the store. He didn't look at the brand or even what flavor they were. He just kept running without looking back. If Izuku could talk, he would happily tell Hitoshi how he got chased by a borderline feral cat obsessed eraser head for over 30 minutes with a bag of chips in his mouth that he stole from the grocery store. But Izuku couldn't talk. Well, talk in a language that Hitoshi could understand. So he would just have to live with this knowledge and often look back and wonder to himself did that really happen? So his little nap may have lasted for way longer than it should. It was honestly the most rest he's gotten in a long while. He looked out of the window at the darkening sky and stretched his body. Moss. Hitoshi scratched his side in his sleepy days. Mossy. He called out again. For a moment he was fearful. Fearful that Moss had decided that he wasn't worth it anymore. Of course, Hitoshi knew he was being silly. But that didn't stop the feelings from being there as the time ticked by without his cat by his side. Well, as predicted, his worry was for not as 10 minutes after originally waking up, Moss would return. Moss came into the cafeteria carrying a bag of chips. Moss walked up to Hitoshi, spat the chip back out of his mouth, and just laid on the ground panting like he had the run of his life. His chest moved up and down so rapidly that it made Hitoshi worry for his cat. He got down to his knees and quickly inspected Moss. After a few minutes, Moss's breathing started to even out and Hitoshi relaxed. When it seemed Moss was going to be okay, he looked at the chips. The chips were a family-sized bag of shrimp-flavored cracker straws, a popular brand. Hitoshi quickly put two and two together. You stole these. There was a tired mew. For me, another tired mew. Oh Moss, I appreciate it greatly. Moss sensed the book coming as he lifted his head and his ears went back, daring Hitoshi to turn down the gift. But I'm allergic to shellfish. Hitoshi explained guiltily. Moss threw his head back and let out a dramatic yowl, as if saying oh, come on, do you know what I had to do to get those for you? Hitoshi couldn't hide his laugh. He gently reached over and scratched Moss under the chin. This forced a purr from Moss as his ears went back in irritation. Hitoshi didn't need a mind-reading quirk to know what Moss was thinking. You're lucky I like you. Hitoshi smiled. I do appreciate this gift and I appreciate you. He kissed his index finger and middle finger and laid those two fingers on Moss's head. But hey, not all is lost. I guess you can enjoy these chips if anything. You and the other cats oh gosh, it's getting late. We should hurry and try and move the other cats here. Hitoshi always knew he had had to move where he fed the cats. It was for the best as his uncle knew where his preferred feeding grounds were. He was honestly afraid it would be a hassle as cats were creatures of habit. 
He worried that not every cat would know that he moved on to a new location, that one or two of the poor domesticated animals would still be near that abandoned area and would perish, yet, it wasn't. When they rushed back to the first abandoned area where the cats were all waiting for him, and thankfully his uncle wasn't, he ran to the trash can to retrieve his forgotten cat food from the day before. Izuku let Hitoshi do that as he jumped from the boy's shoulders to greet Brian and Adelaide. Hey, it's you. Brian surprised Izuku when he bumped his head against Izuku. I was getting worried that you had got hit by a car. Oh, no, no, nothing like that. Listen to me, all of you quickly. We're moving locations. Izuku spoke firmly and the other cats started to quiet down. Moving. Adelie inquired. Whatever for. It's not safe for Hitoshi to be in this area. We found a perfect location. It's just a bit of a walk, is all. Brian and Ailey looked at each other and then Izuku. Who? Brian tilted his head curiously. Hitoshi, the one feeding you. Oh my gosh, he has a name. Adelie gasped and Izuku's ears went back in irritation. Look, please, everyone, listen to me. Izuku rushed to Hitoshi and jumped onto Hitoshi's shoulder. Hitoshi gasped a little as he carefully held the cat food close so as not to drop it. Easy, Moss. Hitoshi huffed. They're not going to hurt you. We're leaving. This human will no longer be feeding you here. If you want to keep being fed then it would be in your best interest if you follow us. Do you understand me now? He looked at every one of the cats. Are we really taking orders from a kitten? Someone had asked. But in the end they did, indeed, take orders from a kitten. They followed Hitoshi rather obediently and expectantly. All of them wanted some food and waited for him to open the bag. Hitoshi, on the other hand, didn't understand how the cats just knew to obediently follow him. But he wasn't complaining. It made it less work for him. Even if some were trying to trip him up by rubbing against his leg as walked. He loved these cats, even if they were a bunch of strays that were abandoned by their owners. Then again, he guessed they all had something in common, didn't they? A couple of days passed and Hitoshi and Moss fell into a pretty comfy routine. Hitoshi noticed that Moss was helping these strays learn how to hunt as it was clear, at least to Hitoshi, that these strays were pretty domesticated when they were abandoned, those poor cats needing a kitten to help them. He thought as he looked at his rations. His rations were starting to grow day by day thanks to Moss wait a minute. Hitoshi didn't want to think too hard about that. Yes, Moss, the thief, had no qualms about stealing from the local grocery store. Again, the smartest cat Hitoshi has ever met as Moss knew to avoid seafood-flavored chips. It wasn't just chips Moss would steal. No, Hitoshi was given food he'd only wish his uncle would give him. Like well, anything really. But the good things like a chocolate bar, a bag of marshmallows, don't ask how, but Moss even managed to steal a whole loaf of bread and even a jar of peanut butter and jelly mixture. It's apparently American. Moss, I appreciate this greatly, but you need to slow down. The people are going to get wise and try to catch you or worse find us. Moss, if they find me they're going to give me back out my uncle, please, please, please. Slow down on the thieving. Hitoshi had scolded the cat when Moss returned from the store with a whole throw blanket. How? Hitoshi didn't know. Moss did do as requested and slowed down his thieving ways for now. But, Hitoshi now hit his first snack. Out of dry cat food, Moss. He informed his cat as he stood up and shook the bag to show the cat. Moss was on his feet in seconds, clearly wanting to see if he could get away with stealing a whole bag of cat food. No, we're not stealing cat food. Moss's ears went back and Hitoshi smiled. Nope, it looks like it's time to do my favorite way of obtaining food, he said with a bit of a mischievous smile. Dumpster diving. Moss perked his ears up at this and was on his shoulder in seconds. Hitoshi gave his own little smile and gently scratched the cat behind the ears. It's not stealing if it's been tossed out, you know. Thankfully it was already dark out, so it made slipping out of the school parking lot easy as he flicked his hoodie up to keep himself hidden in the dark. Then again, he did have a green cat on his shoulder. I usually hit up the pet store, but that's a few miles out. He explained to Moss, let's try the grocery store first. It's closed by now so nobody should spot us. Moss's ears went back as if he was saying it's okay when you do it. I'm not stealing. They're throwing it out and I'm acquiring it through my own means. Hitoshi was sure Moss was rolling his eyes at that half-assed excuse. Walking up to the store, Hitoshi nodded when he saw all of the lights were out of the store. He also noted a handmade sign that made him smile and try his hardest not to laugh. The sign read as follows. If you see a green furred cat, do not let in. It steals. Look at you, you criminal. Only two days here and you're already barred. Hitoshi teased and Moss's ears went back while a low growl left his throat. Hitoshi huffed another laugh and lightly flicked Moss on the nose. Don't get pissy because you got greedy. A snort left Moss's nose and he playfully swiped at Hitoshi with sheathed claws. They walked around the back shortly after that exchange and Hitoshi walked right up to the dumpster. He opened the lid and peered in. Fuck yeah. He climbed up the dumpster and hopped in. His luck was rather on point today as the first thing to greet him was cat food thrown away. Great, I won't have to make the trek to the pet store. He commented as he picked up the bag for inspection. 
It was a simple 25-pound bag of pet kibble. The bag itself showed no signs of water damage, meaning the food wouldn't be damaged too badly. Hitoshi had to open the bag, meaning it wasn't tampered with previously and peered in. It smelt fine, not rancid and he couldn't see any green or fuzzy mold on the kibble. Awesome we found a. Hitoshi looked at Moss but paused when something silver caught his eye. He slowly turned to where the silver was coming from and he found a. Little girl just staring at him with owlish eyes. She couldn't be older than six or seven. Her hair was long and silver that reached her mid-back. She had big red eyes that just seemed to be begging for help. Also, on her head stood a horn of all things. Hitoshi lowered his hood as he stared at her. Hello, he whispered completely stunned. It was the middle of the night. The girl tilted her head innocently at him. Do you eat from here too? She asked as she approached. That was when Hitoshi looked at her clothes. A gray dress. No, shirt. No, a tunic. Maybe. All he knew was that it didn't look like something a little girl should be wearing in this weather. She also had bandages all over her arms and legs alike and she had no shoes on. Her feet were caked in dirt. How long has she been out here for? Moss jumped from Hitoshi's shoulder and onto the edge of the dumpster where he peered at the child. She gasped in fright a monster and immediately started to cower. No, no sweetie. That's just Moss. That's not a monster. Hitoshi whispered and got to the edge of the dumpster, but not getting out. M. Moss. She fearfully whispered to Hitoshi. Is it dot 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 mean? No, Moss is a sweetheart. Here, Hitoshi bent down and picked an apple out of the dumpster. It was still cold, a good sign. He carefully pulled out his water bottle and washed the apple off the best he could. Have an apple, he offered to the little girl. The child looked a little wary, but more of Moss than of Hitoshi. With a quickness, he hated seeing. She snatched the apple and huddled away from him like she was fearful it was going to get taken from her. Then she ate quickly, too quickly. Moss looked over at Hitoshi and once again Hitoshi fully understood. They were taking this little girl back with them. It took no convincing, which, again, put fear inside of Hitoshi. Anybody could have just up and snatched her. He thought bitterly. This girl, clearly, had no schooling of any kind and she was clearly a little too trusting because of this ignorance of hers. She held onto Hitoshi's hand for dear life as he also had to hold onto the cat food. Still, he gripped her hand tightly. Another kitten was hurt and thrown away like she meant nothing. Well, lucky for her, Hitoshi was going to help her in every way that he can the same he does with all the others. Do you have a name? He asked her once he had her tucked in on the table while the cats ate peacefully. Moss stayed by this girl but kept his distance for obvious reason. I'm Uri. Uri, what a pretty name. I'm Hitoshi. Hitoshi, I like that name. I'm glad. Uri looked from Hitoshi and then to Moss. He won't hurt me dot 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 will he? Moss, no, he's a kitty. Like all the other kid is here. He pointed to the other cats eating happily. He's harmless. A fucking lie. Hitoshi saw this cat tear his uncle's arm to shreds, but that was beside the point. Iri shyly peeked at Moss from behind her covers. Moss muted her and she looked uneasy. Do you want to pet him? He's really soft. Iri reached a hand out on her own accord and Moss patted over. He didn't hesitate to rub his head into her hand. Her eyes lit up. He is soft. Yep. He's also really smart. The smartest cat I've ever seen. Is he really? Moss, could you please go and get Iri a water bottle? Hitoshi requested. Moss didn't hesitate. He jumped from the table, went through Hitoshi's pack, and came back with a water bottle seconds later. See, super smart and he'll guard you while you sleep. He'll protect me from. She trailed off and Hitoshi nodded. Yes, I'm sure he will. Moss put the water bottle down and rested up next to Yuri. He's a smart cat and he's loyal. Unlike most cats, you don't choose him. He'll choose you and you'll know it. Really? Her eyes lit up again and Hitoshi nodded. Look, he's chosen you already. He gently scratched Moss behind the ears, earning a purr from the animal. He likes you. Iri's eyes misted with tears before she wiggled under her covers. I'm glad. She whispered as her eyes started to droop with sleepiness. I'm really glad. Watch over her. He asked Moss softly. Moss nodded and laid his head down on his legs. Hitoshi stood up and just stared at Iri for a moment before sitting down away from her to make himself a peanut butter and marshmallow sandwich. This was a wrench in the plans he never would have expected in a million years. I guess. I'm a big brother now. Hitoshi let out a loud wet cough, covering his mouth as he did so. Erg. He groaned before rubbing his watery eyes. I won't lie to either of you. I haven't been feeling too well, lately. Days have turned to weeks of the three of them living inside the old school. How many weeks? They've all lost track at this point. Eri, who is sitting on the table with the throw blanket wrapped around her body, kicked her legs idly as Moss lay in her lap. She was really warming up to Moss and would only allow him to sit on her. She still had issues when it came to the other cats. I've been having lots of headaches lately. Iri whispered softly to Hitoshi and Hitoshi got down on one knee so they were eye level. Are you hungry? No. Thirsty. MMMM. She shook her head. Caffeine withdrawal. What's caffeine? HM. Hitoshi was gentle as he placed his hand on her head. How's your horn? He inquired while gently touching the horn on Iri's head. 
Harry shrugged. It sparked all night, but my quirk didn't go off. Big brother, what's your quirk? You still never told me what you can do. Moss's ears visibly picked up at this. God, how Hitoshi hated having to explain his quirk to people. He hated the quirk he was born with and sometimes he just wished he was quirkless, but he knew that was an unfair wish to wish for. Hitoshi knew just how bullied the quirkless actually were. He was never a bully, he knew from experience, but he's witnessed the bullying for himself. As cruel as it was of him, Hitoshi often just stayed quiet when he wasn't wearing the muzzle and turned his back to the quirkless kid being bullied, begging for help from someone, anyone. If Hitoshi stayed quiet then the bullies would leave him alone. My quirk, doesn't matter. What matters is that you're comfortable and okay. He stepped around the subject. Moss's ears went back in irritation and he laid his head right back down on Uri's lap. Uri scratched at Moss's ears and then up at Hitoshi. Why are you crying? I'm not. He grumbled as his eyes continued to water on their own. It's probably just allergies. Though, outside of shellfish, he didn't have any other allergies. Still, Eri didn't need to know that. Can I see your arms? I just need to make sure nothing is infected. He whispered and held a hand out for her to take. Eri seemed a little hesitant but did hand her arms over. Hitoshi was gentle as he started to undo the gauze around her right arm first. At first, Uri wouldn't take the bandages off at all and seemed scared when Hitoshi even mentioned it but after a lot of coaxing and promises that they weren't going to give her back to the man that hurt her, she relented. Hitoshi was extremely gentle as he inspected her arm. The old cuts have already healed and the newer cuts were looking fairly good when it came to healing, with nothing looking inflamed or swollen. I just can't believe she was abused to this degree, she's such a sweetie. Hitoshi could hear his blood boiling throughout his whole body. Okay, your right arm is looking good. He checked on her left arm the same as her right and gave a satisfied nod. Good. He smiled and then softly rewrapped her arms up. It all looks great. You're healing really well he felt an itch in his throat and Hitoshi turned away so he wouldn't cough on her. The cough was short but raspy and shook his whole body. He had to take in several quick breaths before his fit continued. Moss meowed when Hitoshi continued to cough. Though he coughed some more. I'm fine. A deep breath as his body finally stabilized and he was able to breathe again. I'm fine. He reassured both of them when Uri looked concerned. Just a cold, I'm sure. To be fair, his hygiene hasn't been the best. It was never good when he lived with his uncle, but at least he was able to bathe once a week, but now. However, it wasn't even himself he was worried about, it was Uri. Uri's was filthy, mainly her feet, but her whole body was starting to coat in a thin layer of dirt and grime and he wasn't much better. His hair was greasy and starting to stick in clumps from the lack of wash. We're probably getting sick because we haven't been bathing. It made Hitoshi feel guilty. He and Uri have been held up inside the abandoned school like a couple of hermits. They both had their reasons for not wanting to go out. The fear of being caught by their abusers made them both fearful. Even if we did leave and go to a public bathhouse we don't have the money. I'll need at least 200 yen, maybe even more. He shook his head. Uri rested her head on top of Hitoshi's. I don't feel good. She whined and Moss raised his head before jumping off of her lap. He hopped to the ground and gave himself a good scratch with his hind leg. Then, he looked back at Hitoshi and Uri. Hitoshi saw scheming behind those big green eyes. Moss, he warned the cat. Don't do anything stupid if you're going to go out. And no thieving. His cat's ears flicked lightly and he was soon off. Uri wrapped her arms around Hitoshi's middle. Hitoshi held onto Uri and pulled her into his chest. What do you want for lunch? I can warm us up some soup. It was strange. Despite the lights not working, some, some not all, of the sockets around the cafeteria still have power. Mainly the ones inside of the kitchen. Which helped him as he could have some warm food. He felt some chicken noodle soup would do them both some good. Okay, my head hurts again. Hitoshi swallowed hard as anxiety ate away at his insides like a rabid animal. Still, he did his best to not let his anxiety show. He, instead, picked Uri up and held her on his hip. She clung to him and buried her face into his neck. Come on, let's get some soup and eat it quickly before the other cats get wise of our plan. The other cats liked to rush at them if they smelt food being cooked, such as the way of the domestic cat, so he needed to work fast. Izuku looked at the other cats lazying about the school. Some were laying outside soaking up the sun, but most were inside. There was a couple of them playing with one another while one cat was rushing around the area like a crackhead, clearly having the zoomies. Izuku walked up to a puddle that was on the inside of the building due to a leak in the roof and he drank from it. Once he had his fill of water he padded up to a nearby wall. A wall that the cats have claimed is a scratching wall. A claim that this was their place. He stretched his back by putting his paws on the wall then he scratched. It felt good as it helped sharpen his claws. He finished up fairly quickly and lowered himself back down on all fours. No thieving. He reminded himself as he passed a couple of cats sleeping together. Fine, I can do that. He walked on out of the school and through the schoolyard. The other cats greeted him and Izuku nodded back to them in greeting but continued on. Well dot 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 it's been a couple of weeks since I woke up as a cat and I have to say it's been eventful. 
I would argue more than when I was human. Izuku padded down the sidewalk as he let his mind wander. It was exciting, running away with Hitoshi, at first, but he's showing signs of being sick. He and Iri both. I know they're both too scared to leave the school and I don't blame them. Iri has some sick monster after her and Hitoshi's uncle is still out there. If I ever get my claws on the monster that hurt Iri he's going to have more than just a few scratches to show for it. Izuku flexed his claws as he tensed up. He stopped and gave his long fur a good shake to try and ease his nerves before resuming his walk. Izuku didn't know where he was walking to, just that he was walking. He wanted to help, but if Hitoshi didn't want him to steal, then he was going to have to be smart about this. He needed to help them, but he couldn't steal. As a cat that doesn't leave him with much. Well, maybe he wasn't God's favorite punching bag after all as a thousand yen note smacked Izuku right in the face. Izuku took a startled step back and quickly stomped on the note to keep it still in the wind. This is great. No thieving involved. Hitoshi might not believe it, but I know the truth. Izuku's eyes wandered around to see if anyone was looking for the money before he snatched it for himself and what he found was a little surprising. There, just a little ways off of the sidewalk in a flower bed sat a wallet. You know you have to do the right thing. Yes, Moss was willing to steal if it meant Hitoshi and Ri got what they needed, but he could just take someone's hard-earned money especially if they lost their wallet. He was still Izuku deep inside grabbing the bill in his mouth he walked over to the wallet and clumsily shoved the note back into the wallet. Once it was in he turned to see who owned it, Aburo Shurikumo. Next to the name was a picture that Izuku could go off on. A man with wavy light blue hair that seemed to defy gravity. He had a goofy smile on his face and just looked like a happy person all around. Izuku did note that it looked like this man's right eye was non-functional as all he saw was just a milky white eye compared to his left eye. Okay. He shut the wallet and put it in his mouth. Aburo looked like he could stand out in a crowd, so Izuku went searching. He kept the wallet in his mouth as he walked down the sidewalk. The area was busy and some humans noticed Izuku with the wallet in his mouth. Isn't that the cat that steals from the grocery store? See the green fur? Hey, I think that's my wallet. Here kitty. Izuku rolled his eyes and kept walking from the man that tried to flag him down. The man was clearly not Aburo and was laughing the whole time. Another man laughed a hearty laugh. That cat is at it again. I once saw him steal a whole bag of marshmallows from the grocery store. A bag of marshmallows. I saw him take a jar of peanut butter and jelly. He just grabbed it and walked on out of the store. A woman spoke next with her own giggles. It was a sight to behold. The poor cashier didn't know what to do. Izuku's ears flicked upwards when he spotted wavy blue hair walking down the sidewalk. Ew. He started to pick up the pace as the man was tall, taller than Hitoshi, and was walking away from Izuku with his back to the cat. So, Izuku had to run. He slipped past the people quickly and efficiently. Izuku loved this nimble body for times like these. He eventually got up to Aburo Shurikumo and looked up at the man. Aburo was dressed in normal everyday clothes, jeans and a t-shirt with a messenger bag across his shoulders. The man never even noticed him and Izuku's ears went back. So, he stopped walking, dropped the wallet and he meowed loudly. Nothing. He tried again. The man kept on walking and Izuku soon realized why. Aburo had Bluetooth headphones in his ears. Izuku huffed, picked the wallet back up, and jogged right up to Aburo. Izuku knew this had to be done the hard way. He rubbed himself against Aburo's leg to get the man's attention. Uh, Aburo actually jumped and Izuku also jumped when a cloud was suddenly created and the man hid away in it. The cloud was less than a foot off of the ground. The cloud was big and fluffy white. Seeing how it was so close to the ground and how a whole adult was currently sitting on it, Izuku took it upon himself just to let himself in. He jumped on the fluffy white cloud with ease and sat in front of Aburo. Aburo let out a loud and relieved laugh. You think with how many cats we have at home I would know when one rubs against me. Hey there buddy is that my wallet? Aburo looked shocked as he stood up with ease on his cloud and patted his back pocket frantically. Then he looked at Izuku in a mixture of shock and awe. Did you, you know that's my wallet? He asked and Izuku just placed the wallet down on the cloud floor. Why does nothing faza through it? How high does it go? Does it stay near you? Or can you direct it? I have some a question Sandy CA and task. Izuku then did something that would change everything. He nodded. He answered Aburo's question the way he would answer Hitoshi's or Iri's. Aburo's eyes lit up. Then, he, Izuku, jumped down from the cloud. Whoa there, little buddy. Not so fast another cloud suddenly swept Izuku off of his paws and brought him to Aburo. Izuku fell onto his back and was suddenly picked up by this man. Aburo held him as one would hold a baby. Well, he tried to. Izuku let out a yowl as he tried his hardest to wiggle out of Aburo's grip when that didn't work. Izuku did what he did best. He started swiping. Put me down. But this was a man that had cats for pets Izuku realized. Oh, you're a spicy one. Hang on his scruff was grabbed and Izuku went limp. I should have taken that money Izuku growled lowly. There we go. Oh, you're adorable. Aburo beamed happily at Izuku. Izuku's ears went back in complete and utter irritation. 
My husbands will just adore you. But first I have to be sure. You're not some kid with a cat transforming quirk, are you? Forgive me, but you're rather smart for a cat, so we can't be too sure these days. I'm not going home with you. Izuku wanted to swipe at this man, get him right in the nose where a band-aid was already resting. Izuku then narrowed his eyes and Aburo's smile died at the glare he was receiving. You want smart? How's this? Izuku, using all of his strength, kicked Aburo right in the face with his hind legs. Gah. Aburo dropped Izuku in his shock at the attack and Izuku took off in a run. I tried to be nice. I tried to do the right thing. Next time I'm just taking the money, I swear. He cursed as he ran. It was a little weird. Izuku couldn't explain why. But as a cat, he didn't really like it when other humans tried to hold him. He didn't mind if Hitoshi held him close. Hell, there were nights when he slept in Hitoshi's arms. Especially when the boy was having a nightmare about his uncle. And the same goes for Iri. He loved it when the little girl held him close. It meant she was trusting him. But other people, forget it. In fact, Aburo was the first human that wasn't Hitoshi or Iri to actually get the drop on him and hold him. Stop. Izuku heard Aburo's yell, but it was just too late, as he wasn't paying attention when he crossed the street. The last thing Izuku saw was the giant wheel of a semi-truck. Izuku's mind was fuzzy. He tried to open his eyes and he saw figures, three different figures, surrounding him. That's fucking insane. He heard someone say, though it sounded like they were in a tunnel and they were miles away. Itoshi, he whispered for his human. SHHH, you're okay thanks, Zashi. Something was pushing against his mouth. Hitoshi, Izuku tried again, but all he got in return was something shoved inside of his mouth. It was rubbery and tasted as such as well. It was more on instinct than anything did he start to suckle. Warm liquid poured down his mouth. He's healing right in front of me and I still can't believe it. A new voice suddenly spoke. I can see his ribs replacing themselves. It's dot 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 it's like watching a balloon inflate. How do you think I felt? I witnessed the poor thing getting flattened by a semi. Thank goodness I saw the healing firsthand. I know I got some crazy looks when I picked him off of the asphalt. Itoshi, Ari. The rubber was removed from his mouth as he tried to speak and the stranger pressed it against his mouth again. You're okay, little guy. Izuku was shifted into strong arms and he felt oddly safe as he started suckling again. His healing is going to take a while. I guess the best we can do is keep him comfortable while all his bones realign. A cat with a quirk. I never thought I'd witness it for myself. The voices started to fade and become farther and farther away by this point as Izuku's mind became sluggish. Immortality. Can't be sure. Smart. Human level. Izuku was starting to lose his fight with consciousness and as he slipped his eyes closed he had one last thought. Itoshi. Ari. I'm going to be a little late. With a start, Izuku woke up gasping for breath. Immediately he knew something was wrong. For starters, he was laying in a plush bed and had a blanket wrapped around him for warmth. Where am I? He wondered for a brief moment as he tried to wiggle from his bindings, but the cloth was wrapped tightly around him like he was a little kitty burrito. He was only able to look at his surroundings but not able to leave. The most he could see was that he was in an office of sorts. He was laying on a desk with a laptop right next to him. There was also a ton of paperwork that looked like it needed to be sorted badly. How did I get here? He knew someone must have picked him up, but who? He was hit by a truck if he remembered correctly, and so that meant that someone had to pick up his corpse that means someone found out about my quirk. He realized and he started to wiggle a little more frantically to free himself so he could get out of there. You're awake. The door to the room opened. Oh fuck, it's you. Izuku hissed as a racer had approached and the man smiled. Still spicy, I see. I think I'll name you that. Still crusty, I see. Get away from me. The racer had picked Izuku up with ease and because of the fact that he was swaddled like a cat burrito, Izuku had no defenses. You're looking good for a cat that squashed by a semi less than 12 hours ago. A racer had commented as he held Izuku like he was a baby. But you need to eat. We've realized your quirk probably took a bit out of you. Izuku saw a bottle and he started to squirm. No, I refuse. Just a racer had pressed the bottle against Izuku's mouth and Izuku kept it close. It's nutrients. There's no need to be so anti-bottle. Izuku started to trash against his blanket prison. That that is why you need the bottle. I know you won't eat. You'll just try to escape. Eat first and then we'll talk about letting you go. Izuku hissed in protest and that was his fault. He deserved it when a racer had forced the rubber nipple into his mouth. Eat, a racer had demanded. At first, Izuku struggled, but then he got a taste, and he relaxed. He never even realized how hungry he was. When he relaxed a racer had relaxed. You're cute when you're not being a menace. A racer had teased. Izuku couldn't even be mad anymore. The bottle was finished in record time. Izuku licked at his lips to clean any dribble that the bottle might have caused and Eraser had slowly put him down to the floor. Okay, I'm going to unwrap you. Don't push yourself. You got struck by a truck. I was stabbed too, but you don't know that. The moment Izuku was given just a smidge of slack he took off. He kicked the blanket off of him and rushed to leave the room. He took in no sight as he slammed full force into the closed door. 
You see, I had a feeling you might try something. You may be smarter than most cats, but you're still a cat yourself, and I've raised plenty to know you'd try to run. Izuku felt his ears go far back as he glared at a racer hat. Look, I get it, you prefer to be outside, but I just need to talk to you before you take off. I've been keeping an eye on that grocery store since we first met. I know you've stolen from that store a lot, but it's things cats don't need nor want. Things like bread, marshmallows, and blankets. Are you a human pretending to be a cat? Izuku just stared at him. Eraserhead braced himself on the door when a few seconds of silence passed. You're not leaving this room until you answer me. He stated firmly. Izuku rolled his eyes and didn't care if Eraserhead could see him. Finally, he just shook his head. That made Eraserhead ease up just a bit. I see. Then that leads me to my next question. Are you protecting a human? I've heard rumors of a little girl eating out of dumpsters at night around that area. Izuku and Eraserhead stared at one another once more. Then, Izuku shook his head. I don't believe you. You have no proof. There was a stare-off that lasted maybe 30 seconds. Then Eraserhead sighed. Whatever, just know this, spicy. Fuck you, it's Moss. My door is open if you change your mind. That little girl probably needs human help. Here Eraserhead couldn't believe he was doing this and neither was Izuku. The man opened his wallet and handed over two 1,000 yen notes to Izuku. Stop stealing and be more aware of your surroundings. You nearly gave my husband a heart attack when you got crushed by that semi. Izuku hesitated. Take it, Eraserhead urged. He took the money and once it was in his mouth he ran. He ran out of the house, not even stopping when he noted the two men sitting at the dining table. However, he did hear a familiar voice yell was that the cat? Was that present Mike? He didn't stop to see. No, he just kept on running. It was dark out and he knew that Hitoshi and Iri had to be beside themselves with worry. And he was right. The first thing Hitoshi did was scoop him up into a big hug before flicking him in the nose about five times in a row. You scared me a half to death. You pricked then his indigo eyes landed on the money that was still in Izuku's mouth. Is that money? While Hitoshi was thankful for Moss giving them the money. He prayed the cash was just found and that Moss wasn't stealing from actual people's wallets. Regardless, he did the first right thing. He grabbed Yuri and brought her to a local bath house. Bath for one child and one tea adult. He quickly corrected himself. He didn't want anybody to think that they were homeless. So, he was hoping his eye bags and his height would help him look older than he was. Okay, any towels, shampoo, or soap? All, please. For both. He scratched at his head. And just like that money was gone. Hopefully, this bath will help them feel just a little better. Weeks turned into months. Roughly two months to be exact and Hitoshi hated to admit it, but they weren't feeling any better. His coughing was getting worse and worse by the day and now both, he and Uri, were in a constant feverish state. His days melded together in a constant haze. But still, Hitoshi still tried to keep going. Once a week he and Moss would dumpster dive to see if there was anything they could use. They were finding some decent food that they could use. Like the times they found some canned goods. One night, they even managed to find some blankets that were thrown out due to what looked like a mistake as there appeared to be a giant blotchy dye spot however. They didn't always find things that they needed from the grocery store dumpster. So on those nights they would make the trek to the pet store that was a few miles out or even to the other grocery store that was roughly five miles away. All that mattered is that they had food. Food for themselves and food for the cats. Itoshi sucked in a deep breath and he felt a restriction and a mild pain in his chest. His breath was also shortened considerably. Kiddies. He called out to the cats as he shook the bag of pet food to get the cats' attention. The cats weakly approached, but even they seemed subdued. They weren't as excited and were just all around lethargic. Itoshi opened the new bag of cat food, just a little expired 10-pounder, and dumped about half the bag on the floor. Some of the cats ate, but most just looked disinterested and even walked away from him. Not good, he noted. Moss seemed fine and full of energy. In fact, he was gone now and ran out to go exploring around for some new place to hit up. But the other cats weren't exactly lively. Itoshi felt a cough well up in his throat and he turned away. He covered his mouth as he let out loud and wet coughs from his lungs. His whole body shook and for a very real moment, he couldn't breathe as he just continued to cough and cough. His coughing was so loud that he could hear it echo around the concrete building. Finally, he was able to suck in a deep breath into his abused lungs, only for him to collapse to his knees and continue his coughing. His face flushed and it was racking his thin body so badly that he was starting to see little stars dance around his vision. Then he vomited. There was no gagging, no warning, just the disgusting taste of bile on his tongue. At least the vomit helped him stop his horrid coughing fit. Itoshi spat out the remains of the vomit on his tongue and swallowed hard. He breathed heavily at a rapid pace and leaned back on his hands. He just tried to focus on his breathing. His energy was practically sapped from just that one lone coughing fit. He almost wanted to just lay on the ground and nap. But he couldn't nap, because roughly 30 seconds later he heard the sound of Eri's soft feet padding over to him. The little girl walked into his field of vision. 
Her face flushed red from her ongoing fever and her eyes had tears in them. I don't feel good, she whispered almost fearfully. I know Eri, I don't either, he whispered. He then laid on his back and opened his arms to the little girl. No point in social distancing when they were both sick. Eri got the hint and laid down beside him. He wrapped his arms around her tiny body and she did the same to him. But, I'm sure it's just a cold. He turned his head to cough again. This time it was, thankfully, a little wet cough. Eri then started to cry. She cried the weak sobs of someone frustrated that they weren't getting any better. That caused her to cough. Well, because of her crying her nose started to clog and her coughing became even worse. Hey now, none of that. Hitoshi whispered as he sat her up. I'm I'm so sorry. She hiccuped and flinched away, fearful of being struck. I'll stop. I'll stop. No, sweetie, I'm not mad that you're crying. I understand that you're upset and you have every right to be. But you're going to choke if you don't calm down. Hitoshi had to turn away from her as another round of coughing affected him. Again, he was just glad these weren't as intense as they were before. Once he was done and his throat was now becoming raspy, he looked back at Uri. How does a nap sound? He asked the girl. Uri, still with tears in her eyes, nodded and Hitoshi stood up. The world spun for a moment, but he managed to correct himself. Then, he, with his dwindling strength managed to pick a sniffling Uri up. He held her on his hip and walked back to the cafeteria. Just so you know, you're never going to be in trouble for crying. He told her as he ran his fingers through her long silvery hair. Nobody should ever punish you for, understandably, being upset that you aren't feeling well. He told her. Uri's face softened a little at Hitoshi's words. Once they were back in the cafeteria, Hitoshi laid Uri down on the table and wrapped her in the blanket with his backpack under her head as a makeshift pillow. She gave another sniffle as wiggled against the backpack. Am I going to be sick foe forever? She asked and Hitoshi gave her the best smile he could muster. Of course not sweetie. You're going to get better before you know it. He coughed softly and lay on his own separate table with his own blanket wrapped tightly around his body. You need to get some sleep though. Sleep and food will do wonders for sickness. Hitoshi explained and he turned to his side to face her. Of course, he wasn't going to tell her that sleeping immediately after you just woke up from a said nap wasn't normal. Truthfully, he and Uri have been doing a lot of sleeping lately. So much so that it was starting to concern him, but there was nothing they could really do about it. Both Uri and he were sick as a dog and with no school to go to and nothing else to really occupy their time. All they could really do was sleep to keep their minds off of their sickness because when they're asleep is when they're most relaxed and when they don't feel the sickness eating away at them. Itoshi shut his eyes and wriggled under his covers. He hoped when he woke up he'd be feeling at least somewhat better. But it always seemed like whenever he woke up, he felt worse. Moss had wandered quite far this time. It was fine. He knew his way back to the school, so there was no real worry. This is Kamino. He noted as he padded down the sidewalk. Kamino was a part of Musutafu that nobody should get lost in. Next to Kamino was Hasu, but out of the two of them, Izuku would say Kamino was worse. This isn't that far away from where we live, maybe just two miles, maybe a little more, to the east, lots of stores to choose from for dumpster diving with Hitoshi. But Izuku didn't truly like the idea of Hitoshi walking through Kamino at night. Hell, he didn't like the idea of Hitoshi walking Kamino during the day. Kamino was filled to the brim with villains behind every corner and Izuku was only okay walking around Kamino at dusk because he's a cat and not very likely to get mugged. Izuku came this way because of two reasons. One, he just wanted to see where he was living on the map. Two, he wanted another store to take from. The one store they take from that was five miles to the west was too far for him to take anything big and have to walk all the way back. And the store that was closest to the school was getting wiser about Izuku as he had tried to get in to take some medicine and he was chased out by a woman standing guard. Yes, standing guard. They hired someone to stop his thieving ways and he got hit in the rump by a broom. So, he needed a new spot. He just needed medication for Hitoshi and Uri. Padding along the darkened sidewalk, Izuku kept an eye out for any grocery stores to hit up. The night was becoming quiet with only a few people dwindling here and there. Izuku's ears perked up at the sound of someone talking. I don't need you to hold my hand, Kirajiri. I can walk to the store on my own. One voice grumbled in annoyance. It sounded like a man that smokes a pack a day. A deeper voice responded. I understand, Master Tamura, however. This way I can ensure your complete and utter safety. Izuku's looked across the street to see two people walking down the opposite sidewalk. There a lanky man with baby blue hair was walking next to another man. This man was dressed as a bartender but his body was strange. He seemed to be made of an orangish smog and a metal neck brace was wrapped around the base of his neck. The first man with the blue hair scratched aggressively at his neck leaving thin scabs and welts in their wake. Whatever, I'm not going to get hurt getting Neosporin and some Cheetos. The first man, Tamura, huffed while lowering his hands from his own neck. Better safe than sorry, young master. Izuku made sure to look both ways before he quickly, and quietly, crossed the street to walk with them. They were his ticket for medication. 
Well, it wouldn't take long before he was detected by Kirijiri. The man stopped and turned. Who's there his eyes were just deep dark purple lights. They reminded Izuku of the void when they looked eyes. Oh, it's only a cat. Kirijiri huffed. The thing was, now that Izuku was closer to the two men he started to feel that something was off about this Kirijiri. That there was an air about him that didn't seem normal. It almost made his fur bristle. A cat. Tamura stopped and turned to look at Izuku. The constant scratching started to resume as he tore into his own neck with his fingers. Shame it couldn't be a dog. Cats are lame and jerks. I take back my comment about a racer head being crusty. This is a crusty man. Izuku thought with his ears going back. Crusty, musty, and dusty. He snorted before he continued to follow the men. Tamura took out his phone and started to scroll while walking. If they noticed him following them, they didn't say anything about it. A new game is coming out, Tamura commented. I wonder if father will let me get it. I'm sure he will. I don't think he can deny you. After a bit more of walking, they finally made it to the grocery store. Izuku stopped behind them and saw his first issue. This door was a push-open door, not an automatic. Damn it he thought as the two men walked in with ease and the door shut behind them with a heavy snap of its hinges. Izuku walked up to the door and put his front paws on it pitifully. Then, he whined. It was a low whine that got the attention of the two men. Is that cat still following us? Tamura inquired a little disgusted as they both turned in alarm at Izuku's whines and meows. To prove his point, Izuku started to beat and pitifully paw at the door. Kurajiri's eyes narrowed as he walked over to the door. When he was close enough Izuku let out the most obnoxious and loudest whine he could muster. Kurajiri then opened it and Izuku shot inside. Suckers. He grinned and took off like a rocket down the aisles. This store was smaller compared to the one closest to the school, but that was fine. He didn't need a big selection. Izuku found the medicine aisle and immediately scanned for medication. Fever reducer. Fever reducer. Fever ah. Finding a small vial of ibuprofen, one that probably had like 20 little tablets inside, he took it off of the shelf. He then padded down the aisle where the cough drops were. There is just one problem. They're hanging. They were hanging too high for him to reach. Izuku did try to stand on his hind legs to knock a bag down. But it was just too far out of his reach. Do you? Tamura approached Izuku. The tube of Neosporin in his right hand as looked down at the cat. Do you need help? Tamura sounded as if he himself couldn't believe he was asking this question. Izuku nodded slowly and Tamura almost looked shocked. Uh, this one? He pointed at the cherry-flavored cough drops and Izuku, once again, nodded. He didn't care about flavor, he just needed the medication. Tamura blinked aggressively, but then shrugged and took the bag off of its hanger. Here, Izuku, having plenty of room took the bag and now had two things in his mouth. It was a little awkward having to walk with the bag as it was a little heavier than he intended and because of its large size it dragged along the floor. So, he had to walk strangely to the door. He then had to sit there and wait patiently. Hirajiri and Tamura walked back and Tamura, sure enough, had Neosporin and a family-sized bag of Cheetos with him, as well as a mountain dew. He looked back at Izuku and then coughed as he paid for his stuff. Sir dot 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 is that your cat? Because if it is you have to pay for that stuff as well. The cashier asked once she eventually noticed Izuku. Only she noticed this just a little too late as Tamura was already heading for the door. Tamura turned, looked this lady dead in the eyes, grasped the door, and then said, no before opening the door allowing Izuku his freedom. Izuku tried to run as fast as he could, but the bag of cough drops made that a little hard to do so. It was going to be a long two-mile walk back to the school, but Izuku was determined. He could feel eyes on him and knew that Tamura and Kirijiri were watching him waddle away pitifully with his prizes grasped between his jaws. Finally, he just heard Tamura sigh after a few minutes of watching Izuku. Kirijiri dot 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 give the cat a lift, will you? This is just sad, if you will allow me. Suddenly the ground from under Izuku was gone and he fell with a yowl. For a brief second, he was weightless and felt like he was falling into an orange void before he was suddenly being hell. Not cool. Izuku hissed, accidentally spitting out his medication. I know, I know. Hirajiri's hands were gentle as he held Izuku and both of them with ease. You're clearly on a mission of sorts. Well, let me help you get there a little faster. Just think about where you need to be and I'll do the rest. Izuku gave the man a strange look. He's cold dot 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 too cold. Kirajiri generated no warmth that most humans would. His hands were just too cold and almost felt stiff against Izuku's body, like the flesh itself was in the middle of defrosting. Still, Izuku grasped his prizes into his jaw once more, shut his eyes, and thought about the school. He thought long and hard about the school, letting that be the only thing on his mind. Kirajiri wrapped both hands around Izuku's body and then he dropped Izuku. He tossed the cat up like he was tossing a ball and backed up and once again Izuku was falling. This caused the two items to fall out of Izuku's mouth. He felt like he was falling for a very long time. There was nothing around him except for the ungodly shade of orange that made his fur crawl. 
Then, as soon as it happened, it stopped and he rolled to a stop in front of the school with his two items clattering right behind him. That wasn't fun. Izuku decided fairly easily and he gave his fur a good shake to try and calm his growing nerves. Still, he grabbed his items and did his walk inside of the school. The first thing that greeted him were the other cats, only not in a good way. The other cats were all just laying there looking miserable. Izuku's ears twitched as he stepped inside. I noticed that they haven't been as lively lately but, has it really gotten this bad? Is there a kitty sickness running around? Izuku was starting to feel uneasy. Of course, he knew about Uri and Hitoshi getting sick, hence the medication, but he didn't really know about the other cats. Some cats coughed up white phlegm as Izuku passed by them. Izuku had to awkwardly walk up the steps with the bag in his mouth. He would make it to the cafeteria, where Hitoshi and Uri were sleeping. They were sleeping when I left and that was easily hours ago. A bit of worry hit Izuku as he jumped onto Hitoshi's table first. He dropped the items and pawed at his friend's face. Hitoshi didn't wake up at first. No, it took some pawing to get the boy to open his hazy eyes. Hitoshi looked at Izuku with watery eyes and a red stuffy nose. Moss. Hitoshi wheezed before letting out a loud cough that shook his whole frame. Izuku watched as yellowish liquid flew out of Hitoshi's mouth as he coughed horribly. Izuku, not exactly being a doctor, did the only thing he could think of doing. He pushed the cough drops toward his friend in desperation. Once Hitoshi stopped coughing he looked at the drops and then at Izuku in a hazy state. No, I'm not hungry, he whispered while huddling in on himself. His body was starting to shake almost violently as chills ran down his spine and caused his flesh to rise. Izuku raised a paw up and smacked his friend repeatedly, but it did nothing. He then rushed from Hitoshi over toward Iri. Iri was breathing, thank goodness, but it was clear that at some point in the night she had vomited on herself and either didn't notice or just didn't have the energy to clean herself up. Her fever looked high, higher than Hitoshi's. Not good dot 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 not good. Izuku didn't understand. He wasn't gone that long but yet almost everyone in the building was getting critically sick. They've only lived here for two months but the symptoms started about two weeks in. He jumped over to Hitoshi and grabbed his friend by his ear. He tugged Hitoshi's ear rapidly and tried to get him up and going. Hitoshi hardly moved save for lazily trying to move Izuku. Later, Moss. Hitoshi croaked. Hitoshi started to pant heavily through his fever. Aye. He went back to sleep mid-sentence. Everyone is sick. The cats are sick as are the humans, but I'm fine. His ears twitched and Izuku got a sinking feeling deep in his gut. He feel like something was right there on the cusp of his brain. But he started to panic and the pieces just weren't clicking. So, Izuku only had one thought running through his brain at that point. I need to get them help. All of them. He jumped down from the table and rushed down the steps. He passed several cats and it was as if they wanted to prove this to him as they lifted their heads weakly at him, while others gave weak coughs. One cat, Brian, coughed so badly that it made Izuku hesitate in a step and look back at his friend. He slowed his running and then turned around. Brian, he whispered to the black cat. Moss Brian coughed again. How are you not another cough? Sick. Just got lucky, I guess. He whispered. Don't worry, I'm going to get help. Izuku, knowing he wasn't going to sick, bumped his head against Brian's own head. Just hang tight. With those words, Izuku bounded off again. It was getting dark now and Izuku had to pause to think about how he wanted to do this and just who he should go for. He knew what he had to do. He turned and ran for an apartment building that he's been in only once before. One of the best thing about being a cat was that he didn't have the pain of having a stitch in his side if he ran for too long. He just ran and ran as fast as he could, his legs pumping against the pavement. Izuku would soon come upon the apartment complex and he rushed to the third floor. He then skidded to a stop in front of a door and sniffed the air under the crack in the door. Yep, this is it. Izuku paused and his tail flicked. He sucked in a breath and got up on his hind legs. He then put his front paws on the door. Izuku started to paw at the door vigorously like he was trying to clean it. Nothing. Please be home. He pawed even harder making a loud swiping nose. Nothing. Nobody in the home stirred. Oh god. Sucking in a deep breath. Izuku let out a yowl. If anybody was around they would have thought, Oh my god, who is torturing that poor cat? With the sheer amount of volume he put behind his voice, he finished his yowl and when he heard nothing, he sucked in an even bigger gasp of breath and tried again. Only this time louder. He could be in the book of world records for the longest meow. Izuku watched in a bit of shock as a fuzzy paw suddenly slipped out from under the door. It was a solid gray paw with white toes. Be quiet. The paw smacked the ground. Some of us are trying to sleep. I need help. Izuku argued with the cat. I know at least two heroes live here. The paw gave another smack. Well, you're doing it all wrong. The only human here right now is deaf. Then can you get him for me? It's an emergency. Izuku wanted to cry in frustration as he started to pace back and forth in front of the door. There was a sigh of irritation. Let me see what I can do. The arm retracted and Izuku could only sit there. Impatience and worry flooded through Izuku's body as he waited for help. Come on dot 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 wake up. 
Izuku tapped his paws impatiently before he just couldn't take it anymore. He started to paw and swipe at the door again trying to get attention. He watched as the light turned on under the door crack and he let out another yell. What in the world? Izuku heard someone on the other side whisper before the door was unlocked. When the door opened, Izuku jumped back a bit and looked up at present Mike. His long blonde hair was down. He was only wearing a pair of sleeping pants, no shirt, and his glasses were red thick framed squares, not his usual triangular glasses, and Izuku did the see the hearing aids in his ears. He pushed his blonde hair out of his face as if he was looking at Izuku right. Spicy, he inquired. Whatever, help me. Izuku started to bound away but stopped just a few steps later. And he looked back at present Mike. Present Mike rubbed his eyes and looked at Izuku. Izuku's ears went back and he rushed up to present Mike again. He rubbed himself around the man's legs and then bounded off a few more steps again. You want me to follow you? He asked. Izuku nodded and present Mike blinked harshly at this. Abara wasn't kidding he whispered and slipped on some slippers that were right by the door. He then shut the door and walked up to Izuku. You do understand us. Izuku started down the steps and kept looking over his shoulder, making sure present Mike was following him the whole way. After the fifth or sixth time Izuku checking, present Mike said, I'm following. I'm following. He reassured Izuku when they both got to the sidewalk. Izuku then started to pick up his pace to a trot. He wanted to run, but he didn't want present Mike to lose him. Dior Present Mike wrapped his arms around his torso at the chilly night air. Izuku didn't care. Present Mike quickly stepped in time with Izuku, having to power walk to keep up with the cat. They turned down the sidewalk. I'm getting escorted by a cat. What is my life come to? Present Mike laughed as he shook his head. Izuku charged forward and crossed the way. He could see the school coming up and he picked up the pace even more to the point of running as he was sure Present Mike could see him. He got halfway across the courtyard of the school and stopped before turning to look at Present Mike. Present Mike stopped outside of the school at least 10 feet away from the entrance. Izuku rushed back to present Mike and rubbed himself along the man's legs once more with soft mew leaving his mouth. When he was sure he had present Mike's attention again, he ran back to the courtyard. Only this time he did a few steps and turned to look back at the man. Present Mike did not move. So, Izuku, let out another mew. A mew that would turn into a meow, then into a yowl of impatience. What's the hold up? He demanded and started jumping up and down demanding the blonde to follow him. Present Mike took out his phone from his pants pocket, calling an ambulance. All the better. Let's get a move on. Izuku trotted up to the man. He could hear the ringing of Present Mike's phone from where he stood. Then, he could hear a familiar voice on the other side. What is it, Zashi? Sho, you were right. Spicy came back. I think he wants to show me where the little girl is, but Sho. It's in the abandoned school. The school. That high school down the road. Yeah. H.M. Okay, I'll get Aburo and we'll be there in less than 10 minutes. I'll bring the respirators. Hang tight. Izuku blinked. The dot 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 what? Itoshi often wondered what the Grim Reaper would look like. As a child, he thought the Grim Reaper looked like the stereotype most people knew of. The dark black cloak that hides a white skeleton with a sigh. Well, that wasn't the case, but he wasn't too far off. He heard movement, the sound of footsteps, and it made him turn to look at who was behind him. There, he thought the Grim Reaper have come to take his soul. A man with hair as black as the night draped around him that gave the appearance of a cloak as it melded into the jumpsuit he was wearing. The man had deep black eyes that seemed to stare into Hitoshi's soul. Only, instead of a scythe he came equipped with a respirator mask strapped around his mouth and nose. Wheezing breaths left Hitoshi's mouth as he panted through his fever. He saw the reaper reach for him with an alabaster hand and he thought this is it. I figured they would come for me while I was still with Uncle Ju, but no. Itoshi rolled his head away from the reaper and waited for the touch to take him away and for this sickness to finally stop. Then, a hand wriggled under him, and at first, he was sat up before the second hand hooked under his knees. This kid can't weigh more than 80 pounds. The reaper spoke, his voice tinny from the respirator. You're telling me, this poor thing is way underweight. Came another voice that caused Itoshi's head to jerk in surprise. There, another man stood holding Yuri in his arms. Itoshi couldn't focus on anything from this man. His mind was getting fuzzy. Hitoshi's mind swam and he felt his mind start to go quiet again. We got two children, critical. The racer head came rushing out of the building, Hitoshi in his arms. He placed Hitoshi on the nearest gurney. Aburo, or rather, Loud Cloud while on the job, wasn't too far with Yuri in his arms as well. Izuku stood on present Mike's shoulders and watched everything go down with critical eyes. Police, animal control, and ambulances were called shortly after Shouda and Aburo arrived. The police were busy putting up crime scene tape. While animal control was making quick work of all the cats on the inside, collecting and putting cats in animal carriers, Present Mike turned to look at Izuku. I'm assuming you didn't know the story behind this place. Present Mike inquired as he approached the entrance but didn't cross the line. Why it was abandoned? Izuku shook his head. The place is filled with mold. 
Black mold, toxic mold. The mold is mainly in between the floors and between the walls. It was also caused by a quirk. I don't know the full details. But apparently, a kid had a quirk that caused the mold to seep into the concrete walls and under the floorboards. The mold was said to be stronger than regular black mold and caused people to get sicker faster. The whole place was condemned with signs everywhere Ah, Present Mike leaned down and gently flicked some dirt off of the ground. When he did so there was a loud swish like he moved it off of a hard surface. Then he felt around the area and found his opening. He squeezed his fingers under the surface of whatever was below him and yanked up. There a metal sign came free from its dirt prison. Present Mike blew the dust and dirt off of the sign with one big breath and there the two of them read the big bright yellow sign that, if hung up properly, Hitoshi and Izuku wouldn't have missed. This property is condemned. By order of Musutafu Police Department, not safe for human occupancy. No trespassing. Damn, Present Mike muttered and looked at the building that was now getting new yellow ribbon put around it. I bet this will light a fire under the city to finally get this place destroyed. He then huffed and placed the big yellow sign on the side of the fence facing the outside so the passerby could see it and not make the same mistake that they had for the last two months. Both children have a pretty bad case of pneumonia. The doctor started as he looked at the chart. I'm more concerned with the little girl as she's more at risk of worsening because of her young age and her immune system might have trouble fighting such a serious sickness. However, we noticed that the boy has a more advanced stage of pneumonia and have reason to believe that she picked it up from him. Regardless, we have them both on antibiotics to help fight the sickness. The doctor gave a sigh and flipped the clipboard paper over before continuing. Now, because of the mold spores in the air and how they were quirk-based, we have even more of a reason to believe that the spores themselves weaken both children's immune systems and are caused pneumonia in the first place as mold toxicity has been shown to lead to respiratory infection. Because the mold was quirk-based we had to not only bathe both children, who were filthy but take their current clothes off and dispose of them as we couldn't risk the spores getting on anyone else and causing an outbreak. Also, both children will be under quarantine as a safety precaution. The doctor finished up. Shouta looked at his husband, who also had the same concerned face as him. He then looked up at the doctor. Did you get a name for either of them? Unfortunately not. Their fevers were too intense and both were barely conscious but, um, your hero's correct. The doctor inquired. Yes, all three of us are. Shouta was the one to answer and on cue, Aburo and Hizashi showed their license to the man. It was funny, Hizashi still wasn't wearing a shirt, but remembered to bring his wallet and phone with him when Spicy came to him earlier. At least Aburo was nice enough to give Hizashi his jacket that he had laying in the back of his car. The man nodded and beckoned them with his finger. Follow me, he urged and all three of them did so. They started down the hallway and the doctor spoke a little more urgently than he had moments ago. I mentioned to you how we had to strip both children down, yes. Yeah, Aburo answered. Well, both children are showing signs of at least physical abuse. Oh no, Hizashi whispered and the doctor brought them into a room. Not the quarantine room, no, but his own office. Sit, the man demanded and pointed to the three chairs sitting by his desk. They all did and he sat across from it and hurriedly took multiple pictures. Now, these first set of pictures are coming from the boy. He warned them and then laid five different pictures in front of them. There, on the boy's tiny and skinny body by his torso god, I can count his ribs, he's too skinny. Shout a thought were marks, bruises that were in various stages of healing. Most were healed but there were still a couple that was still prominent in color. These bruises looked too perfect, in the shape of an oval. A spoon, Aburo asked as he looked at the same picture Shouta was looking at. Yeah, that's a spoon bruise if I've ever seen one. He was right, Shouta realized, that those bruises were probably caused by a cooking spoon. The next picture showed a few more of the oval bruises on the child's legs. The third picture showed the boy's front teeth. What's wrong with his teeth? Shouta asked. It's just the front teeth, but if you look at them they're cracked in multiple places. Here he pointed to crack on the left front tooth. Here another crack going along the same tooth. Here onto the right tooth where there was, indeed, an elongated crack. And here, right next to the first crack on the right tooth was another crack. Now, he could just be grinding his teeth at night, but teeth grinding is mostly seen in the molars. However, I am not a dentist. Yet, if you look at the fourth picture here, the doctor pushed the picture towards Shouta. This one showed Hitoshi's face which was flushed pink with his fever. His head was turned to the side and the focus of the picture was on his cheek. See this indent. The doctor used his pen to point at the indent on the side of Hitoshi's face. It looks like something had rubbed that spot raw and the spot was forced to heal over it. Oh my god dot 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 it's a muzzle. Hizashi whispered. His eyes were wide with alarm. Those are strap marks. His teeth are cracked because he was probably forced to bite on something. A bar, maybe. Hizashi put two and two together. How can you be sure? The doctor asked. Hizashi paused and looked at husbands. Aburo nodded and reached over to pat Hizashi's hand. Show him Zash. Aburo encouraged. 
Hizashi sucked in a deep breath and turned his own head towards the man and raised his hair up away from his cheeks. There, by his ears, laid almost the same marks, only a little more raised. This was completely hidden from everyone. His marks were hidden either by his long hair or his costume collar. The only people who knew about this were sitting in the room with the doctor. A muzzle, meaning he was probably forced into one because of his quirk, Shouta theorized. After all, that's why Hizashi was forced to wear one for almost his entire childhood by his parents. The last picture was one of an x-ray of the kid's chest. This one is pretty self-explanatory. The doctor, once again, used his pen to point. He has several fractures in the ribs. Not just the one here that's in the process of healing either. If you look at at least three different ribs you can see healed fractures. The doctor pulled the pictures back once they were all seen. Now the little girl is more alarming. Oh god. Shouta's mouth went dry and Aburo reached over to grab his hand. The boy was bad how could it get worse? Shouta was secretly crossing his fingers and chanting in his head please don't be sexual abuse. Please don't be sexual abuse. Over and over. He was unsure if his heart could take it if there was. The doctor opened and closed his mouth before finally just showing them the picture. There were fewer pictures of the little girl. Only three. This first picture was just to show her weight. Now, I'm aware that she and the boy have been living on the street for the past while. However, you see what I'm seeing. The cuts. Shouta gritted his teeth. Cuts, thin little cuts made with a surgical knife, no doubt, littered her little body. Each picture was the same. The abuse done to her was someone cutting her up like she wasn't a little girl. Like she was just a piece of raw meat on the table. I believe no six or seven year old is this precise with a knife. The doctor stated firmly and clasped his hands together. We, at first, thought these two to be siblings. But the abuse doesn't add up. They both experienced a different type of physical abuse. Oh and we did check. Neither child, as far as we know, has been sexually abused. The knots in Shouta's shoulders all released at once making him relax at that news. So, because of this, we had someone with a DNA quirk test their DNA. They aren't related. Not in the slightest. Shouta chewed on the inside of his cheek as he looked over the pictures again. Two children, both physically abused and homeless found each other. He muttered and gently rocked back and forth while thinking. You can bet, once we get their names. Those that did this to them won't be leaving with them. That's all I can ask for there was a sudden noise and before they knew it the vent was thrown open above them. All four of them jumped when a green furry lump fell onto the desk. What in the world? The doctor gasped and looked at the cat before looking up at the vent. Spicy, the little devil, shook himself off and tried to make a break for it. He scrambled off of the table, trying to run for the door, but Shouta was faster. Oh no, you don't. Shouta grabbed Spicy right before the cat could jump. Spicy let out a hiss of distress and started to wriggle like he was possessed. A yowl left the cat's mouth as he wiggled and thrashed against Shouta's grip. Shouta took his scarf off and, with expert hands from years of wrangling children and cats alike, he wrapped his scarf around Spicy. He wrapped Spicy up in a way so the only thing not wrapped in his grey scarf was just his head. Nice try. Shouta teased. Spicy hissed his ears going back. He then threw his head back dramatically and yowled like he was being tortured. Sorry about him. Shouta then held Spicy over his shoulder like one would a toddler. He's not ours, but we found him with the children. We have reasons to believe he's quirked. He explained. Spicy paused, sucked in a breath, and let out another yell. Yeah, I'd say so. The doctor looked at Spicy and then back up at the broken vent. Thank you for the update. When will the children be out of quarantine? Oh, be quiet. Shouter reached over and literally shut Spicy's mouth with his fingers. For as smart as he was, he was still a kitten and had the jaw strength of one. A week. The quarantine is just making sure all the mold spores have died. The doctor had a slight look of amazement on his face. Of course, thank you. The three of them then walked out of the office. Once out of the office, Shouter released Spicy's maw. Thankfully, the kitten didn't go on another screaming fit. However, he did try and bite Shouta's fingers once he was released. Behave. He gave Spicy a little, not hard, flick to the nose. The kitten wiggled his nose before his ears went back and an angry hiss left his mouth. Shouta then positioned Spicy so the kitten was against his shoulder and he braced Spicy by placing a hand under the kitten's bum. Spicy, still wrapped, let out a meow. Then another, and another. Shouta could feel the cat try and free himself, but the cat wasn't strong enough to break free. Hey, little guy. Aburo was gentle as he carefully reached over to pet Spicy. It'll be okay. Spicy hissed, a warning that Aburo was getting too close. Aburo paid no heed to Spicy's little warning and scratched the top of Spicy's head with his nails. Spicy groaned in annoyance and his ears drooped lowly after a few seconds. At first I couldn't believe it when you came out with two children living in that school dot 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 but after witnessing those pictures dot 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 yeah. I get it now. Hizashi whispered. I bet they'd both do it again as long as it means not going back to their abusers. Yeah. Shouta whispered the same as his husband. Yeah. Shouta figured Spicy wouldn't like being locked away in the apartment and he was right. 
The moment the door was shut and Spicy was released the cat rushed to the door. Spicy, looking fully betrayed, let out a long meow. No, Shouta shook his head. You're not leaving. Spicy's ears went back and he looked like he was pouting when he sat abruptly at the door. The three adults looked at one another, unsure on how to you're welcome to sleep with us. I'm sure a bed would be nice. Spicy turned his head away from them and then laid down in front of the door. All right, well, there's a litter box in the bathroom. Bathroom is on the right. Our room is the last room on the left. Shouta informed Spicy as the three adults walked towards the back where their bedroom was. Is it just me? Or is it weird talking to Cat like he's a regular guest? Hazashi asked while the three of them walked into their bedroom. No, it's weird. Shouta confirmed with a sigh and rolled his neck to try and loosen a new knot that was starting to form. Aburo came up and pulled Shouta in from behind. He rested his head against Shouta's neck. Shouta leaned into the touch and sighed softly. What are we going to do? He whispered. About the children. Shouta nodded. I was thinking about that too. Mike came up and hugged Shouta's front, sandwiching the man between him and Aburo successfully. They're both so tiny and need help. I don't want to put them in the system, especially the boy. He was muzzled for a reason and I'm willing to bet it's because of his quirk. While I don't know what his quirk entails, I'm gonna go out on a limb it'll make others try and muzzle him again. Shouta stayed quiet as he pondered on Hazashi's words. Aburo, the big softy, said what Shouta feared he would say. As heroes and teachers of UA we have emergency foster licenses. All right, hold your horses. We don't even know these children. We need to talk to them first before we make any rash decisions. Shouta told both of his husbands and then wiggled out of their hug. It's going to be a while anyways. Both are under quarantine and are trying to fight off pneumonia. Yeah, Aburo sighed and took out of his phone and Shouta noted that Hizashi also had his own phone out. His own eyes narrowed. What are you two is that Amazon? They have no clothes. Aburo jumped on the bed to avoid Shouta who made a grab for him. He then created a cloud to float on. He sat crisscross on his cloud and floated up to the corner of the room. Don't worry, show just some clothes will help them in the long run, even if we don't foster them. Well dot 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 it was a little hard to argue with that logic. And you, Zashi. Shouta looked over his shoulder at his other husband, Hazashi. Unable to escape via cloud like Aburo, turned his back to Shouta while his typing increased. Okay, okay, I know we talked about having children one way or another, but don't go crazy, you too. These children aren't ours and are both clearly traumatized. Well, I'm going to bed. Shouta explained and started to strip out of his hero suit. It's been a long night and I'm tired. Once stripped down into his boxers he got into bed. Oh, hello there. Shouta jumped in surprise when something fuzzy touched him and he lifted the covers to see his three cats. Jelly, a short-furred female gray and white tuxedo cat. Brat, a Cornish Rex calico that had eyes too big for her face and looked like a harsh breeze could sweep her away with how skinny she was. And Tiny Tim, a brown and white tuxedo munchkin cat so low to the ground that his stomach touched it. Shouta, Aburo. And his ashy often joked that he was bred with a winnier dog with how long this cat was as well as stout. There you guys are. I was wondering why you didn't greet us. Maybe it's a good thing you didn't. I'm not sure how the new addition may react to you. Shouta cooed and picked up Tiny Tim. Tiny Tim didn't care as Shouta cradled and snuggled with him. None of the cats cared when they were held or snuggled. Where's my bratty brat? Hizashi pulled the covers back and plucked his beloved brat off the bed. The cat meowed lazily at this. Once Aburo was done with his shopping he hopped from his cloud and allowed it to dissipate on its own. Then, he grabbed the last remaining cat. Jelly. It was Jelly that woke me. Hizashi told them as he got into bed next to Shouta. I thought it was Spicy. No, Spicy was at the front door and I couldn't hear him until I put my hearing aids in. I was fast asleep. Next thing I know Jelly is jumping up and down on my chest until I woke up. Call it whatever you want. But when Jelly woke me I just... I had a feeling that something wasn't right. He placed Brat down on his chest and the cat had no more protests. The area on his ashes chest was Brat's favorite place as it was warm and Brat didn't have much fur to keep them warm. Well, it's a good thing you had that feeling because, I won't lie, I don't think those children would have survived much longer. Aburo was the last to get into bed. They looked really sick. He muttered the last bit and held Jelly in his arms while twisting on his side to look at his husbands out of the three of them. Aburo was the only one who slept on his side. Yeah, Shouta whispered back while he idly scratched at Tiny Tim's head. I hope they get better soon. HM, me too. Hazashi looked close to falling asleep and Shouta reached over to take Hazashi's hearing aids out of his ears. As he did this he heard Aburo ask, Hey, where's Pumpkin? Pumpkin, their fourth cat. A street cat that Shouta found protecting Tiny Tim, and one that has seen many many fights. Pumpkin was named after his short orange fur. He was also a tabby with pale green eyes. Shouta often wondered if Pumpkin might have been quirked because this cat was strong, but, unlike with Spicy, it was near impossible for him to know for sure. I'm sure he's around here somewhere. Shouta responded as he and Aburo intertangled their fingers. MMM dot 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 he might not like Spicy. 
You know how long it took for him to get used to jelly and even then he puts up with jelly. Yeah that's true. For a moment Shouta did think about finding Spicy and putting him in the study like he had before. But Spicy is smart. You said it yourself. He found your wallet and gave it back to you. I'm sure he'll avoid Pumpkin if it came to it. Besides, Pumpkin is a reasonable cat. Izuku was in the middle of trying to find a way out of this apartment he was passing the kitchen. Going to test the windows to see if maybe they left one open when he caught a whiff of another cat. Of course, he's been smelling the cats that these people own, but this whiff was different. Then, he saw the shadow looming over him only illuminated by the moon outside. Izuku managed to jump out of the way just as this other cat jumped down from the dinning table. This cat was massive. Izuku thought Angel was big. She was nothing compared to this big orange beast that zoned in on Izuku. Well dot 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 the humans just couldn't help themselves could they? The cat sneered. Izuku's fur bristled up. There was an aura about this cat. An aura that reminded him of Bakugo. The way this orange cat was doing everything he can to intimidate Izuku to the air that just screamed I'm the best and everyone else is beneath me. They see a pretty kitty and just have to take him home. The cat started to get close and Izuku slunk low to the ground. His tail curled around his body as his fur bristled even higher. A loud hiss escaped Izuku's mouth. Oh, are we trying to be loud? My turn the orange cat then mimicked Izuku's hiss. This cat's hiss was way louder than Izuku's he also did an excellent job at showing off his fangs while getting right into Izuku's face. A high-pitched whine left Izuku's throat as he gnashed his own teeth together. His tail tapped the ground and, though it's not the most respectable, he turned and tried to run away. Izuku knew in a one-on-one -on -one battle with this beast he'd lose. This cat had longer legs and was easily able to get in front of Izuku, forcing him to a step. Where you going, kitten? Izuku tried to turn the opposite way but was quickly stopped as the cat leapt in front of him. Try again. Out of the corner of his eye, Izuku saw a way out. Izuku gave Yowl and swiped. He smacked the cat right in the face with his claws. He felt his claws sink into the bigger cat's face. Ack. The cat took a step back in alarm and Izuku took that to his advantage. He rushed to the couch and quickly went under it for safety. The couch was low to the ground and if Izuku were any bigger he wouldn't able to fit. Which is why he chose this place. Huh. Izuku gloated. He could see the orange cat's paws start to pad around the couch. Not bad, kitten. Not bad. It's moss to you. Izuku hissed. The orange cat huffed and continued to try and find an opening that wasn't there. So, you think you can just come here and start demanding things? Oh, no. Don't get it twisted. The humans may feed us but I'm the leader of this house. The other cats do what I tell them to do and here you come along telling Jelly what to do. Nala, you need to know your place. Izuku followed the paws with his eyes, twisting and turning under the couch so he'd always know where this cat was. You sound like an old ex-friend of mine. Izuku couldn't help himself from saying, we didn't get along well. There was a snort and Izuku quickly scrambled back as the orange cat tried swiping at him. This cat had some claws, big and white that looked like they could shred into flesh like it was paper. It made Izuku look at his own claws. You're not like the others. You're smart. Do you have a name? Or what? Pumpkin. You better get used to saying it too because you're going to be begging for me to stop whenever I get my claws on you. To CH. Izuku's mouth twitched as a laugh suddenly erupted from his throat. Pumpkin. Pumpkin. You expect me to be scared of someone named Pumpkin. That's like telling me to be scared of someone named Daisy. It just doesn't make sense. He laughed loudly. Shut it. Pumpkin's paw tried to swipe at him again. You won't be laughing when I finally get you in my grasp. Pumpkin started clawing at the floor in a desperate attempt to get at Izuku. He's only on one side. Not only that but I highly doubt he acts like this if the humans are watching. I wonder. Izuku looked at the other side of the underside of the couch where Pumpkin wasn't. Their room is the last room on the left. Pumpkin is fast, yes, but Izuku was smart. As long as Pumpkin was distracted he might be able to make it. You can't hide there all night. Pumpkin hissed another one of those hisses that made Izuku's fur fluff up in alarm. Izuku gave another hiss of his own. Watch me. Pumpkin stopped for a moment and retracted his paws. He then started to quickly pad over to the other side of the couch where Izuku was laying. It was when he was nearly there did Izuku make his run for it. He ran wriggling out from under the other side of the couch where Pumpkin wasn't and he went for the bedroom. Get back here. Izuku heard Pumpkin's roar of indignation once he realized what was happening. Izuku zoned in on the bedroom and he could see it just right there. He was inside the open door in record time then. Using his hind leg he snapped that door shut with ease. There was a resounding thump. On the other side as Pumpkin slammed his head into the shut door. Then came the growl. It was deep and murderous. It made Izuku's skin crawl. You'll pay for that. You better not leave the human's side ever because once I get you alone there'll be nothing left of you but shreds. Izuku snorted. Whatever. Kakin he paused, realizing his mistake. Just, whatever. I'd like to see you try. Then, Izuku jumped up onto the bed. He shook his fur and lapped at his chest before looking at the humans that were all fast asleep. His ears went back. It didn't feel right. 
He wanted Hitoshi, he wanted Iri, but he couldn't get to either of them. He felt bad for sleeping here on a nice warm bed while they were in a hospital, scared and alone. Izuku walked up to a racer head, where another cat was already sleeping next to him. A cat with stubby legs. This cat opened their eyes and lifted its head. Ah, a new arrival. They yawned and smacked their lips. I hope Pumpkin wasn't too harsh on you. Oh no, he was a delight. Izuku sarcastically replied before promptly jumping on Eraserhead's chest. Eraserhead coughed in surprise. Spicy. He whispered sounding a little amazed that Izuku would even be here on him. Izuku then got as close to Eraserhead's face as he possibly could and then laid down in such a way that his side was pressed up against the hero's nose and mouth. Good night, Izuku told the hero before laying his head down and attempting to sleep for the night. Eraserhead didn't seem surprised. A little miffed, but not surprised. Jelly, Brett, Tiny Tim, and the man himself, Pumpkin, Breakfast, Aburo called, and immediately the four other cats, yes, the great and mighty Pumpkin included, swarmed the man at his beckoning. Izuku was not one of these cats. He just watched the man from his spot on the countertop. Izuku was honestly surprised that everyone in this household was all early risers, even Eraserhead. Eraserhead, or Shouta as he was called a lot, was sitting at the kitchen table reading the paper next to present Mike or Hizashi. They both were holding hands as Shouta read one-handed and Hizashi ate one-handed. It would be cute if they weren't keeping Izuku prisoner. It's been a week, he thought as his ears went back and he turned away from the adults. One long week away from Hitoshi and Uri alike. Apparently, they're both fighting off their sickness as their pneumonia was pretty severe. The good thing was that they'll be leaving quarantine soon. Aburo grabbed five different bowls and started to fill them up with something that had a cat on it. It looked like milk, but Izuku figured that might not be the case. At least it wasn't actually milk. Whatever it was, made the others, even Pumpkin, go crazy. Izuku yawned and then looked away disinterested. Breakfast. Aburo chirped and put the milk mixture in front of Izuku. It's lactose-free milk, so it shouldn't disrupt your stomach. Aburo pushed the bowl towards Izuku. Now that he was closer, Izuku was actually able to see his right eye. It was as he thought. Aburo looked to be blind in that eye. There was no color and Izuku saw the faint scar that trailed down the man's face. Izuku looked at the milk and he leaned down to sniff it. It smelled like milk. Not hungry. He decided and looked away from the drink. Oh, come on, little guy. You've got to eat. He urged by pushing the drink a little closer to Izuku. You can't force a cat to drink if he doesn't want to, Aburo. Shouta boredly spoke without looking up from his paper. Aburo sighed a little and took his seat at the table. He then started to fill his plate with food. I'm just concerned. Spicy hasn't really been eating. I know. He's just worried about the children. We should be able to see them later today. Izuku's ears visibly perked at that and Shouta noticed. Izuku noticed that Shouta noticed and the man's mouth ticked into a smile. That got your attention. Yes, I got the call last night. They're out of quarantine. Now, under normal circumstance, no animal is allowed in the hospital, however, I happen to have something that will give you a pass of sorts, but you have to behave. Shouta sternly told Izuku. Izuku's ears twitched out of curiosity. Shouta put his coffee cup down and got up. I guess, I might as well show you. He then left the room. Izuku watched the mango and then he looked at Aburo and Hizashi. His mouth filled with a bit of saliva as he noticed the sausages on their plates. Hey, those don't look that bad. He wondered if he could snatch one off of their plate. Izuku watched as Pumpkin came up to the table and started to rub needily on Aburo's legs. Aburo didn't even hesitate. He bit off a quarter of his sausage, took the piece out of his mouth, and gave the tiny piece to Pumpkin. Izuku knew better than to jump down from the counter. He doubt Pumpkin would like him stealing his move. Well, it turns out Pumpkin would be the one to try something. Once he had his sausage his head turned towards Izuku. Next thing Izuku knew this cat was on the counter and drinking his milk. Hey, get your own. Izuku demanded as his fur puffed up. Pumpkin stopped his drinking, looked at Izuku, and blinked owlishly. Oh, was this yours? Pumpkin, you better behave. Came Tinnitim's voice from down below. Yes it was. Izuku seethed. Now he wanted the milk just out of spite. Pumpkin put his paw on the rim of the bowl. Why bad? And with that he knocked the milk over the counter. It landed on the ground with a loud clatter causing the liquid to go flying in every direction. Pumpkin, came Hazashi's scolding voice. The cat ducked his head down and he tried to make his escape but a cloud swept him off of his feet. Aburo, using a finger to direct the cloud, just brought the culprit to Hazashi before he could take off. Honestly, you big baby. The new cat comes in and you always act up. Hazashi continued to scold Pumpkin right there as he held the orange cat in his arms. Pumpkin did try to make an escape, but Hazashi just held on a little tighter. I warned him. Tiny Tim sighed as he walked with Brat. It was kind of funny watching the two. Brat was lanky, tall, and thin, but Tiny Tim was stout, chubby, and short. Then a cloud came by and swept Izuku off of his own feet. Hey, I didn't do anything. Izuku wanted to get away, but Aburo grabbed him. 
Poor thing. Here, Aburo was nice to give Izuku some of his sausages once Izuku was situated in his lap and the cloud dissipated. Don't mind if I do. Izuku happily munched on the whole sausage gifted to him. He wasn't greedy. He stayed on Aburo's lap and ate with his head down. Izuku made sure to do big bites so not to choke. Hazashi finally put Pumpkin down and went to get a towel to clean the mess the cat had made. Pumpkin did try to come around to Aburo but was nudged away. Nah, you had milk and some sausage. He didn't get anything. Thanks to you, mister. Oh man, if looks could kill. Pumpkin was giving Bakugo a run for his money with the glare he was sending Izuku. Izuku finished his sausage and stretched himself out on Aburo's lap before he jumped onto the man's shoulder. Oh, Aburo gasped in alarm and then he held very very still. Like he was too afraid to move. Izuku licked his paw and swiped it over his ear a few times to get it clean. It wasn't until Hizashi and Shouta came back did he realize why Aburo had gone as stiff and still as he had. Oh shit. Shouta chuckled as he came up. How'd you do it Aburo? I don't know. His breath was hitched slightly but he sounded joyful. Aw oh, man, I wanted to be the first he'd warm up to. Hizashi playfully whined and he dropped the towel to soak up the milk. Oh, Izuku looked at Aburo and the man was looking at him with wide, but joyous eyes. Let's face it, Zashi, we both knew it was going to Aburo. He spoils those cats rotten and may or may not be the reason Pumpkin is the way he is. Now, you shout a scooped Izuku up in a swift motion. Izuku groaned deeply in annoyance but allowed it, though he couldn't stop his ears from going back. If you want in the hospital you have to behave and you have to wear this. Shouta held up a vest. Izuku recognized it immediately as a service animal vest. His body was moved up so he was on his hind legs. He didn't fight it when Shouta started to strap the vest to him. Within seconds the vest was on him. Think you can do it. Shouta put Izuku down on his front paws. Izuku, never one to back down from a challenge, stood up and immediately flopped to his side. The vest threw any and all equilibrium off. Oh dear. Aburo snorted and he was biting his lip like he was trying not to laugh. Shouta picked Izuku up by the handle of the vest and had him sitting up again. Okay, let's try this again. Shouta let Izuku go and down Izuku went to his side again. Can you at least try? Shouta inquired as he picked Izuku up by the handle once more. Let me strap something to your back that feels strange and tell you to try, Izuku argued. But all that came out of his mouth was a mew, he was sure. Shouta put Izuku on the floor this time. Once he let go, Izuku tried to walk, but it was just so weird. His walking fell off as he dipped his back to try and accommodate this thing that was strapped to him. He knew by his ashes and Aburo's laughter, it must have looked a sight as he wibbled and wobbled under this vest. Then, he flopped to his side again. Clearly he's going to need to get used to the vest before you even attempt to pass him off as a service animal. Aburo gave a small laugh and he got up from his seat. He then walked up to Izuku and picked him up and placed him on his feet again. Okay, it's like riding a bike well, you're a cat, so you wouldn't know what a bike is. But regardless, let me be your training wheels. Aburo kept his hands on either side of Izuku to keep him steady. You're a smart cat, yeah, so, just try and walk as you usually would. Izuku immediately knew where this was going to go. Aburo really meant it when he said that this was like riding a bike because he was, clearly, going to treat it like one. Still, he didn't have any other way of getting used to this vest. So, he started walking with Aburo holding him up and keeping him balanced. Shouta got up from the table and he was gone for several minutes as Aburo and him walked around the living room. It was weird having this man bent over helping Izuku walk with this vest on. But Izuku wasn't really complaining. It was helping him get used to the vest. Spicy. A bag was shaken and Izuku looked up to see Shouta. The man walked past them and was soon in front of Izuku, a bag of cat treats in his hands. He gave the bag another shake. The other cats, Tiny Tim, Brat, Pumpkin, and Jelly came rushing over to him. They cried and rubbed against Shouta's legs. Shouta squatted down and threw a couple of treats away from himself and the others went chasing after the treats. Come on. Shouta beckoned Izuku with his index finger while giving the bag another shake. Izuku started to walk over to Shouta. And before he knew it Aburo had released him and he waddled uneasily towards the man. His body shifted, but he was able to stay upright long enough to make it over to Shouta. Shouta held on to the treat and Izuku took it from the man's hand. There we go. Shouta then shuffled back a few steps and took another treat out of the bag. Come on, he urged. It was getting a little easier for Izuku to walk with this vest on now that he's had some help. So, by this second attempt he was getting better at walking with this thing strapped on him. He was still a little wobbly and his body wanted shift back onto his side but he managed to fight it. He took the treat from Shouta's hand once again and as he was eating he felt a hand scratch the top of his head, taking cheap shots while you can. Izuku gave a warning growl and Shouta backed off. Stilly spicy, Shouta sighed and then looked at Aburo. Hey, Aburo, aren't going by to see that kid you saved a while back. Why don't you take spicy? This way he can get used to the vest and learn how to be a service pet. It shouldn't be too hard for him to at least learn the basics of emotional support. His ashi suggested to Aburo. 
That's not a bad idea. Aburo agreed as he walked over to door, where the coat rack stood. There, dangling off of the coat rack was a leash. Come on spicy, it'll be fun. No, Izuku flopped onto his side. If I'm going to be on a leash it better be to the hospital. You have to learn. Besides, if anyone needs emotional support it's this boy. Come on, Aburo. Not taking no for answer from a cat. Clipped the leash to the harness and started to drag Izuku's limp body towards the door. The only people I am willing to offer my emotional support to right now are Hitoshi and Iri. If it's not them then I don't care. Izuku hissed, his ears going back as Aburo continued to drag him along the hardwood floor. It won't be so bad. Aburo promised as he stopped trying to drag Izuku. He instead walked up and picked him up by the handle of the vest. Izuku just sighed as he was now being hoisted out of there like he was a suitcase. This sucks. Izuku thought as he was finally moved out of the apartment with Aburo. It was like the man sensed Izuku's rather hesitance about this whole thing. Don't be so glum, little guy. Seriously, it's like I said. This is just training so the doctors don't suspect you to be a fake. Whatever, let's just get this over with. The sooner the better. Izuku rolled his eyes and Aburo smiled at the wind. There's a good kitty. He scratched under Izuku's chin before he continued to walk him towards the car. Usually I'll float away on one of my clouds, but it's best if we just take a car for today. I'll take you on a cloud when you're not so dot 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 or dot 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 top heavy. He gave her a cheeky smile at Izuku. Izuku felt his ears twitch back again before he looked down at the ground. He watched the ground move as Aburo continued to carry him all the way to the car. Izuku let out a meow and Aburo chuckled a little. Don't worry, this kid doesn't live too far. He tried to comfort Izuku before putting the kitten into the back of his car. Izuku grumbled once the door shut. Let's just get this over with. He thought and sat on in the back seat while Aburo got into the driver's seat. Soon, Aburo was driving. Izuku snorted as he watched the world move outside of the car for a long while as the silence fell over the two of them. Well, it turns out Aburo just couldn't stand silence as he started speaking. Yeah, he started loudly and unprompted making Izuku jump a little. I saved this boy a few months back. He got attacked by a villain and nobody could help him out. Thank God I was just in the area getting some food for the hubbies. I managed to help the poor thing before it was too late. Izuku tilted his head and once the car stopped at a stoplight Izuku leapt from the back seat to the passenger seat. Hey, buddy. Aburo smiled, reached over, and scratched under Izuku's chin again. Don't be running around while I drive. Okay. Izuku nodded. As Aburo continued to drive along the road, Izuku patted the man's leg. What? He inquired and gave Izuku a half-second look before looking back at the road. Izuku kept on patting at his leg. HM, did you want me to continue? He asked after a second or two of silence. Izuku nodded. Huh, alright. Well, there's not much to say really. The other heroes were rather pissy because I stole their safe. That happens a lot that no amount of classes will ever prepare you for. He gave an awkward laugh and turned down a street. Heroes really get possessive if the save is theirs so they can get the glory. I mean, as someone in the top 10, I get it. I really do, but saves aren't everything. At least not to me. What matters are the victims. You know, he asked and Izuku nodded. Yeah, you get it, buddy. Those heroes were just standing there, unable to help because of inconvenience to themselves. Several of those heroes could have done something but it would have caused them pain. That poor kid was drowning in sludge and they were just standing there. Izuku's mild excitement died as he stared at Aburo. Drowning? In dot 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 what? His eyes went wide as the memory of the sludge villain. The villain that he hadn't thought about once since he woke up as a cat. The feeling of the thick goopy sludge sliding down his throat and blocking his airways. The poor kid was terrified. He was just a middle schooler and those heroes did nothing. But All Might. All Might caught that villain. Izuku thought. Don't you worry about that dastardly villain any longer, fanboy. All Might beamed as he showed Izuku the sludge villain that he had contained in a bottle. I got him contained. I don't understand. I don't understand. Izuku felt his fur rise slowly as his eyes went wide. Wait, I have a question. Izuku cried and he, in a desperation he didn't even know he had, grabbed onto All Might's leg. He clung onto the man and wrapped his arms around his left leg just as All Might sprung into the air like he was spring-propelled and the two of them flew up higher and higher until Izuku saw the tops of buildings he never thought he'd see. What? Get off. All Might gasped in horror and actually tried to kick Izuku off of his leg. It was me. Izuku realized in full horror. He had caused the bottle to slip from All Might's pocket when he clung to the man like an imbecile. A part of him does wish that I'd never met him. That he never saved me. That he didn't jump onto All Might's leg. That why All Might never, never crushed his dream on that rooftop. That he never jumped from that building. But then, he never would have met Hitoshi, nor Iri, and, suddenly Izuku was okay with his choices. To see Hitoshi's smiling face again. To see Iri's eyes light up just the slightest whenever Hitoshi and he came back with an apple for her after one of their dumpster dives. And he thinks that jumping off of that building was the best thing he ever could have done for himself as Izuku Midori. The poor quirkless kid who wanted to be a hero, was dead. 
he would never feel the hurt and sting of being quirkless again. Yet, despite that, knowing that he was the cause for the sludge villain escaping and attacking some poor other kid hurt, it hurt him so much. He never meant for that to happen to anybody, and he couldn't even apologize to the kid for being the sole reason the villain got loose. And then, get this, All Might shows up. At the very end to capture the villain while I soothe the child in my arms, I just managed to separate the villain and victim with my cloud, but couldn't capture him. I was so pissed. That man should have retired eons ago. You know he's a liar right? Aburo asked and Izuku snorted. Oh, I know. Izuku agreed with an eye roll. He doesn't even look like how he appears to be. The man isn't buff, he's a skeleton. Why do you know that? Izuku wondered as he stared at Aburo. I guess, I gotten off topic. Aburo shook his head. Stupid hero commission is pushing him on Yue and he's taking my classes. Foundational hero studies is my job and the commission demanded Nezu give him the class. That pissed me off so bad. The man doesn't even have a teaching license. Aburo ranted in his indignant anger. Take it from experience. Buddy, that man shouldn't be allowed near children. Izuku told him and he started to swipe behind his ear with his paw. Ha, huh, you get it. It was trippy. It felt like he, Aburo, was agreeing with what Izuku was saying. But in all reality he was just agreeing with him now Izuku simply gave. Regardless, Aburo scratched at his eyebrow. Now, I've been moved and I'm a sub. I guess that's fine. It gives me more time to be a hero during the weekdays once school starts back up. Still, I can't help but feel that this is going to be a disaster. He ran his hand through his hair and pulled the car off to park it. We're here. Come on, spicy. Let's give you some experience. Aburo opened his arms and Izuku jumped into them. Aburo was grinning at this. Shouta is going to be so jealous. He opened the door and got out. I know this place. Izuku thought as his ears went back in fear. He stared, horrified, at the Bakugo's home. No no no. SBSB spicy. Aburo tried to wrangle Izuku and as he started to violently thrash around. Calm down. It's okay. No. Izuku got free from Aburo's arms. But the man grabbed the leash and Izuku was quickly pulled on the ground. Spicy, what's the matter with you all of a sudden? Aburo asked. He tried to pull Izuku along, the way he had earlier. But Izuku sunk his claws into the soft dirt beneath them actually giving Aburo resistance. No, Izuku wailed loudly, throwing his head back in pure desperation, and Aburo dropped the leash in shock. Izuku quickly took this moment to flee under the car. Did you just? No, I must have just heard wrong. Aburo got down and poked his head under the car to look at Izuku. Izuku's ears were fully back, eyes wide, and fur completely puffed out. Sweetie, they're not going to hurt you. Aburo tried to coax him out from under the car, but Izuku wasn't budging. I'm not going in there. I'm not facing him again. Never again. Never ever. Izuku shook his head. Hello? Izuku's ears perked at the soft voice. It was a voice he wasn't expecting to hear so soon. It was a voice he'd honestly think he'd never hear again. Though, Aburo jumped in alarm and got off of the ground. I'm so sorry. He gave a shaky smile while dusting himself off. A cat got under the car. He explained and then offered his hand. Aburo Shurikumo, or Loud Cloud. I'm the hero that saved Bakugo Katsuki. Are you his mother? No. In Ko Midoriya. I. I just live here. She whispered and Izuku watched them shake hands. I'm good friends with the Bakugos. I'm renting a room from them. Midoriya. Aburo almost seemed to whisper in question. Oh, I see. It's nice to meet you. I'm just here to do a checkup on young Bakugo. The two of them started to walk away and Izuku couldn't help himself. He peeked out from under the car. His mother's back was turned to him, but he could see that she had easily lost a lot of weight since the last time he saw her. She was wearing her work scrubs. His mother was an RN and he wondered if she had been taking up extra shifts like when his father left them. She had taken up a lot of extra shifts, 12-hour shifts, just to forget about the pain. He couldn't help but wonder if she was doing it again. Izuku watched the two of them going inside of the Bakugo's home. Once the front door clicked shut, he wriggled out from under the car and just sat there. Ain't that a kick in the teeth? He thought sadly with his ears now hanging low. Izuku sighed and turned. He jumped on the car's bumper and continued to sit there. So, Kak and Bakugo. Bakugo was attacked by the villain I released. Of course Izuku felt bad for his old bully. Nobody deserves to feel themselves drown in sludge because a villain wants to take over your body. Izuku's mind was all over the place. He felt awful for being the reason the villain got out a second time. Then he was angry. Angry at himself. Angry at the world. Then he was guilty again. Guilty because his mother was living with the Bakugos because he decided to be selfish and jump. Then right back to anger because he might not have jumped if Bakugo hadn't have baited him into doing so that very morning. I jumped because I wanted to leave my old life behind and I can't even do that. I'm still fucking tied down to being Izuku Midoriya. I can't just be moss or even spicy because everything is connected. Everything. It was unfair and cruel. Roughly 15 or so minutes later Aburo would emerge from the house with Bakugo Katsuki not that far behind him. Aburo was beaming as he approached his car. Bakugo, this is spicy. 
He's training to be an emotional support animal, so don't worry too much about him. Izuku and Katsuki locked eyes. Katsuki's eyes went wide and almost scared. Izuku's ears fell back and he immediately turned his back on Katsuki in an instant. Right. Well, I just wanted to say, I'm glad you're doing better since the attack. Aburo explained to Katsuki. Whatever. Katsuki huffed a little. I'm fine. Of course you are. Hey Izuku was suddenly grabbed by Aburo. And he was forced around as the man held him. Would you like to pet? Spicy. Izuku gave a low growl as a warning. He pets me and I'm biting his fucking hand. Err, no, no offense. He dot 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 he weirds me out. I can't explain why. Katsuki shook his head firmly. I have to go now. I have homework to do. Katsuki turned abruptly and gave Aburo a wave. Thanks for the checkup loud cloud. Izuku's ear twitched a little. Is it me or does he sound a little more subdued? Izuku wondered as his anger melted for only a moment. Katsuki's posture was a lot more slumped, his head a little more low, and his aura just all around more depressed. It's obviously because of the villain attack. Izuku huffed out as he clambered up Aburo's shoulder. The door shut and Katsuki was gone. He stopped caring for me long ago. Aburo looked at Izuku. You know the point of being an emotional support animal is to provide emotional support. Aburo shook his head. What are we going to do with you? He wondered out loud. Perhaps that was my fault. You're still just a little too spicy. Come on, let's go back home and I'll run you through a quick guide. But, it's like Shouta said. It's not going to work if you don't behave while in that vest. No more tantrums like the one you had earlier. As long as Bakugo isn't around me, I can guarantee there won't be another one. For Hitoshi the last week has been a hazy feverish dream. He truly thought he died at one point, but his mind was finally cleared up and his fever broke. Now he realized he hadn't died but was saved. I wish I were dead. A cruel thing to wish for. But they were going to give him back to his uncle and he wasn't going back without some sort of fight. He was already thinking about an escape. Not without Iri. He decided. He didn't know what became of Moss, but he prayed his cat was okay. Right now, he could only focus on getting Iri out of here same as him. He looked at the little girl that was still sleeping feverishly in her bed. He didn't want to remove the girl, not until her fever was gone. He turned his head to give a weak, but raspy, cough. What if I'm healed and she's not? They'll kick me out. Hitoshi's mind was running about a thousand miles a minute as he went through every scenario in his brain. He didn't know what to do or even say. All he knew was that he wasn't leaving without Uri, and, if they didn't know who he was, he wasn't giving them a real name. He heard the doorknob rattle and Hitoshi immediately pretended to be asleep. They can't talk to him if they think he's still in a fever-induced coma, can they? You're terrible at faking. A voice that wasn't the doctor immediately to him as the door snapped shut. Hitoshi tried to remain still. We're playing this game. The man inquired and Hitoshi listened for his footsteps. But the man was so quiet. He felt movement close to his face and something was just lightly brushing against the tip of Hitoshi's nose. So, I suppose you don't want to hold the cat we worked hard to smuggle in here. Hitoshi's eyes snapped open and he was face to face with Moss. Moss meowed. Moss. Hitoshi took his cat from the man. The man with black hair and pale skin. Oh, I was so worried about you. Moss purred lovingly against Hitoshi's neck and shoulder. He rubbed himself under his owner's chin. Moss? Huh. I'm sorry, I'm still calling him spicy. The man chuckled and pulled a chair up. He's not spicy. Hitoshi almost wanted to argue. At least not to me. H.M. Shouta leaned back in his chair and eyed Hitoshi up and down. You got a name? He asked Hitoshi and Hitoshi licked his lips nervously. Yeah, Taro, Taro Yamada. He whispered nervously and the man snorted. I'm not dumb, kid. That's a name they used on the dead that doesn't have names or they can't find names for. Hitoshi shook his head. I'm not going back. He told the man quickly. I refuse. Moss jumped onto Hitoshi's shoulder and lay against his shoulders while staring at the man. The man leaned on his arms and narrowed those onyx eyes at Hitoshi. There was such a cold aura about him that made Hitoshi sweat nervously. Look, you're scared. I understand. But we're not handing you back to your abuser. Same with that little girl. We want to keep you too safe. But we can't do that if we don't know who you guys are and who we need to keep an eye out for. The man explained. He then brought a hand out for Hitoshi to shake. My name is Shouta Aizawa. He then paused as he waited for Hitoshi. Hitoshi frowned and he looked at Moss. Moss looked at him before nodding. There was a deep sigh from inside Hitoshi's ribcage. Hitoshi, he confessed and took Aizawa's hand in his. Hitoshi Shinsu, as for the girl, I just know her as Iri. So you aren't related? No sir, I found her one night. Thank you for being honest. They shook hands and then let go of one another. I'm a hero, so trust me when I say we're going to do our hardest to look after you and Iri during this time. No child should have to eat out of a dumpster or sleep in a mold-infested school. Hitoshi sucked in his lips inwards before he nodded a shaky nod. A sense of happiness and relief completely overtook his body as tears threatened to spill. Someone was finally going to listen to him. Then, he reached up and patted Moss between the ears. Thank you. Thank you. It was just the strangest thing. 
Aburo shook his head as he and Hizashi sat outside of the hospital room. They decided to let Shouta talk to the children and hung back. I'm telling you, I heard Spicy scream no. When I was trying to get him into that house, Aburo sipped his hospital-grade coffee. He's not like regular cats. We've already had this discussion. Hizashi told his husband. I know he's not. It's just, he refused to go near that house. Absolutely refused. He had his claws buried into the ground and everything. Aburo just didn't know what to really feel about what happened earlier. It was something that kept replaying on a loop in his head over and over again. Oh, you're not going to believe who else I ran into. Who? In Ko Midoriya. Midoriya oh shit the kid that. Aburo nodded. The kid that Shouta found. I suspect she was that boy's mother. He explained in a soft voice. Hizashi shook his head. That suicide really messed with Shu. I know. I know. Aburo shook his head. If only he were there just one minute earlier. He will probably forever beat himself up over that poor kid's death. The silence between the two husbands became heavy. Thankfully the tension was broken when the door opened. Shouta came out. No spicy to be seen. Shouta shut the door, turned to his husbands, and spoke firmly. Call Nedzu. We're fostering these children. Fuck yeah. Aburo jumped up in his chair, nearly spilling his drink. Looks like we got to clean out the study. We're do that today. They still have to stay under observation for a few more days so we have time. We'll have to blow up the air mattresses for the time being. But I doubt there'll be much complaint from either child. They were sleeping on tables in the school so an air mattress will probably feel like a temper pedic. I have to call child protection. Which is, always a joy. He shook his head and took his phone. It was the start of something wonderful. All three of them could feel it. You're adorable. Aburo whispered as he brushed Iri's long hair. Look at that hair. Iri munched on her apple slices. Thank you. She whispered a little nervously. Hitoshi watched Aburo a little cautiously and he was quickly spotted by the man. He then turned away from Aburo and focused on Moss, who was resting peacefully in Hitoshi's lap. Moss was practically dead to the world as he heavily slept. I think that's probably the first time I've seen him sleep on someone. Well dot 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 that wasn't Shouta's face. Aburo whispered the last part with a smile. Aburo knew that Hitoshi didn't seem to like to speak too much. When talking to adults he doesn't speak unless spoken to. He must really like you. I haven't seen him hiss or swat at you once. He's never hissed or swatted at Miori. Hitoshi shook his head and he gently scratched Moss behind his ears. Maybe it's just adults he doesn't like. Does that mean when I get older he won't like me anymore? It was such a weird thing to think about but then again Moss was a weird cat. Maybe dot 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 or he knew you needed help. Aburo asked gently as he moved from Uri over to Hitoshi. You know when I first ran into him I had lost my wallet. He found me personally to return it. Wow, he can resist the urge to steal. Itoshi was actually impressed and it made Aburo smile. However as quickly as the little bit of sarcasm came it was gone. The little life left his eyes as he shut his mouth. I'm sorry. That was rude. Hey, you don't have to apologize. Aburo reached over to move some of Hitoshi's hair out of his face and the boy flinched away from Aburo's hand. Aburo paused and lowered his hand. He swallowed hard and then rubbed at his face. Hey, you're getting released today. That has to be nice, right? You and Uri get to come home with us. Hitoshi kept his mouth shut as he looked down at Moss, now unable to look Aburo in the eyes. You know, I won't judge you if you want to talk about anything. I mean you're going to be living with us. If there's anything you want us to know, anything you don't want around you because of trauma, we'd like to know. Hitoshi shook his head and twisted to his side so his back was to Aburo. By moving like this it caused Moss to wake as he fell down from Hitoshi's lap. Moss poked his head up and placed both paws on Hitoshi's legs. He then moved and wiggled under Hitoshi's arms as Hitoshi was resting his head against his head. Moss's fur was soft and he was so close that Hitoshi could feel the fur tickling the inside of his nose. Moss crossed his front paws like a proper gentleman and then went back to his nap. Right, Aburo whispered. Are you hungry? He asked the boy in a gentle tone. Hitoshi shook his head and his lips stayed firmly shut. Okay, well I'm going to step out. I have to make a phone call. So, just hang tight. Aburo went to walk out of the room but was stopped by Eerie. Mister, yes, dear. Aburo skidded and Uri nervously fidgeted with her blanket. If if it's not too much, could I have another apple? With the brown stuff. You want more apples and peanut butter? He asked her gently and Uri gave an excited nod. She then gestured for him to come closer. He did. She leaned up and whispered I don't know if you can get your hands on it but Big Brother likes marshmallows. Thank you. He whispered back to her before retreating. Aburo walked out of the room and made sure the door was shut before he started to walk down the hall. He put his phone to his ear. His shoulder was smacked by someone walking the opposite of him. Sorry he looked at the stranger. This was a man roughly two inches shorter than Aburo. He had choppy short brown hair and light honey brown eyes. He wore a black collared shirt, white tie, black pants, and white trainer shoes along with white cloth gloves on his hands. He probably would have been average looking dot 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 if not for the strange mask on his face. A mask looked like it was imitating a large bird's beak, like a toucan. 
The beak itself was gold and red in color and just too intricate for Aburo to describe. Forgive me. The man's voice was muffled behind the mask. It's no problem. I wasn't looking where I was going. Aburo told the man and with that simple interaction was done. Aburo. He heard a voice yell through his phone and he nearly dropped his phone in freight. Yes. Yes, I'm here. Shu. Sorry, I just bumped into someone. The door to the hospital room opened and Hitoshi immediately sat up in alarm when a man he didn't know entered. The man gave Hitoshi no mind as he looked from Hitoshi's stunned face and zoned in on Eerie. Eerie grew pale. There you are. The man spoke rather lackadaisically as he narrowed his eyes at Eerie. I, no, don't even try to explain yourself. Not only did you have me looking all over Musutafu for you dot 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 but now look what you've done dot 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 you got others involved. The man's eyes landed on Hitoshi. I guess I should be grateful. You kept her safe from what my intel managed to gather. For that, I'll spare you. Hitoshi's heart rate sped up as he eyed the nurse's button just on the nightstand right there. Don't test my patience. Suddenly the man was in Hitoshi's face. He had both of his hands on the sides of Hitoshi's bed. Everything has been delayed because of her. He pointed at Uri. I can't afford any more. So, just be a good little boy and do exactly what I tell you. I'm going to take this girl and you're going to say that she ran off while you weren't looking. Understand. The man almost made it a show to fiddle with the end of his glove, like he was getting ready to take it off. Don't hurt him, Eri whispered fearfully as she started to clamber out of her bed. Don't get involved, Eri. The man looked away from Hitoshi to look at Eri. That was when Ma sprung. He was quiet in his attack. He jumped from Hitoshi's arms and directly on the man's face with a yell. The man cried in alarm and took a step back away from Hitoshi. Hitoshi watched as the man started to break out into what looked like angry red hives from his contact with Moss. Hitoshi's body was completely frozen. He felt like he was being restricted to the bed. Then his horror only grew when the man managed to rip Moss off of him while Moss was in the air. The man removed his glove and Hitoshi understood the threat loud and clear when Moss became nothing more than a bloody mess that splattered all over Hitoshi. Pest. The man hissed. An absolute pest. And just like that Moss was gone. With a snap of a finger and the cat was nothing more than drying blood splattered against Hitoshi's face. Eri let out a scream. Don't. The man turned to her in an instant. You don't get to scream and cry when you cause this, Eri. Why the fuck are you crying, boy? This is your fault. You don't get to cry. Hitoshi was shaking. Give him back, Kai. Eri still whined as she tugged on the man's hand desperately. Please, Kai. Give him back. I'll go. I'll go quietly. Just give Moss back to Hitoshi. Kai looked down at Eri with something akin to disdain. Why should I? Did you see what the pest did to me? He pointed at the scratches on his face from Moss's claws. Because because. Because Moss didn't mean it. She cried as tears fell down her face. He he's just a dumb cat that thought you were a bird. She now wailed. Please bring him back. Uh. Eri shrieked in alarm when Kai grabbed her by her hair and pulled her back harshly. No more running away. He hissed. No more. She promised. To ch. The man raised a hand up and snapped his fingers. Just a simple movement from him and boom Moss was back. Moss looked confused as he jumped around on Hitoshi's bed in alarm. We'll be taking our leave. Kai hissed to Hitoshi as he grabbed Eri by her arm. Eri's head hung low as she just allowed herself to be taken. Moss looked like he was going to give chase. Hitoshi snapped out of his fear-induced stupor the moment he grabbed Moss's leash. Moss wailed at this. What the fuck are you doing? Don't you ever use that quirk of yours. Uncle Ju snarled while wielding his wooden spoon. It's a damn curse. You're like a villain with a quirk like that. A classmate sneered at Hitoshi as they pushed him down. I wonder how long it'll be before you end up in Tartarus with the rest of the villains. Don't talk to that one. One boy had told a new kid. His quirk can make you do anything. Wait. Hitoshi yelled as he stood up. He had to hold Moss in the air by his leash to prevent the cat from trying to run off. Just wait. He breathed heavily. The man stopped and looked over his shoulder at Hitoshi. Don't test me. Kai hissed dangerously. What I did to your pet I can easily do to you. I know. I just have one question. What is your plan with her? Please, I just need to know. Hitoshi knew he was putting everything on the line. Everything with this one question. You don't need to concern. Kai's eyes went white as Hitoshi activated his quirk. Uri, he snapped his fingers. Get over here. Uri gasped in shock as she looked at Kai and then back at Hitoshi. She shook her head. I promised. Just do it. Uri swallowed hard and let go of Kai's hand. She was slow as she constantly looked back at Kai, expecting him to yell at her to come back, but it never came to be. She fully walked up to Hitoshi and put her hand in his. Moss stopped his wailing as he just observed with wide and intrigued eyes. Hitoshi clenched his fists and bit at his lip. He's only ever gotten this far. Usually, by now he'd let his victims go, but not today. He couldn't afford it. No, you don't need to concern yourself with Uri anymore. In fact, Uri is dead. He spoke lowly. You found her body in a ditch she was he looked down at Moss. Stabbed. She was stabbed. This girl right here. You don't know her. You don't recognize her because Uri is dead. 
He repeated while placing Moss down. He then swallowed hard as tears threatened to spill from his eyes. Go back to your car and drive. You get the fuck away from this hospital. Drive until you run out of gas and don't you forget. Here he is dead. She is no longer living. Itoshi demanded. Go. He pointed towards the door. Kai turned and walked out. His head was low and his arms swayed limply, but he was gone. Itoshi swallowed hard as he watched the man leave. He kept the man in his hold for a long time. Drive. 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 Even when I let go of you. Drive. He urged when he did have to inevitably let the man out of his hold. Aburo would return to the hospital room not even five minutes later. Okay. I had to go the store across the street the bag in his arms dropped as he looked at Hitoshi in pure alarm. Well what in the world happened to you? He demanded as he rushed up to Hitoshi. Hitoshi, on instinct, flinched, fearful that he had been caught using his curse of a quirk and was now going to get rejected. You're covered in blood. Are you hurt? Where? Who hurt you? Aburo demanded urgently. Here he hugged Hitoshi's middle so suddenly that it caused both Hitoshi and Aburo to look down at her. She started to cry softly. Thank you, she whispered to Hitoshi. Thank you. Hitoshi sighed and ruffled her hair. What are big brothers for? He whispered before licking his lips. He then looked at Moss. His cat jumped to the bed and was staring at Hitoshi intensely. Just how many lives is this cat going to have? He thought. Then he looked at Aburo. The blood isn't mine. It's Moss's. When you left this guy he... He wasn't pleasant. Shouta scowled as he crossed his arms over his chest. How many times have they watched that video footage? Too many times. Aburo had called them in a hurry. Hazashi couldn't leave because of classes, but Shouta could because his class was expelled. Now, here he, Aburo, and a security guard were. I left them alone. He could have killed Hitoshi. Aburo whispered from his chair. I he rubbed at his face aggressively. Not even five minutes into fostering and I nearly got them killed. They didn't even get to the house. Shouta shook his head. It's not your fault. You had no clue. This guy didn't let anyone know why he was there. He didn't even tell you when you bumped into him. Not that it matters. Thanks to Hitoshi we're probably going to be able to arrest the guy pretty swiftly. Did he tell you what he said to the man? Shouta asked. Aburo shook his head. He started crying. I think he was afraid that he was going to be in trouble and despite me telling him he wouldn't be in trouble, he refused to talk anymore. So, I couldn't bring myself to ask. He sighed and stared at the ceiling. Poor kid. He did a good thing, but I don't think he sees it that way. A brainwashing quirk. He muttered as he rewatched the footage of Hitoshi putting the guy under. It would explain the muzzle and why he clams up around adults. Shame people only ever see the downsides of a quirk like that and never the good side. The security guard butted in. Forgive me, but a quirk like that is kind of bad. What good would it ever do to put someone under your control? Case and fucking point. Shouta pointed at the screen. Jumpers, Aburo added. He can easily stop people from committing suicide. Hostage situations. Shouta threw his hands up. Having a quirk like that is honestly amazing. Especially if he goes underground and nobody knows who he is or what his quirk can do. It's the ultimate advantage. The man put his hands up in defense. My bad. Shouta snorted and then his mouth ticked in a smile. It was just a small smile. But a smile that Aburo noticed. Oh his husband noted the light in Shouta's eyes. I like that smile. It's. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself a tad. Shouta rubbed at the back of his neck looking almost embarrassed. Let's see how things go before I count my ducks. First, let's arrest this prick for child abuse and then find Hitoshi's uncle. Did you search the house? I did. Bastard fled. He knows the heroes are probably gunning for his ass. He'll show up sooner or later and when he does, he'll be meeting the end of my scarf. Well, later that night, it was officially time to move the kids and Moss into the house because neither kid still didn't have clothing. They were allowed to keep their hospital-issued clothes for now. It was funny, this time Moss seemed a lot more willing as long he was with Hitoshi. So, you'll have to share a room for the time being. We're looking into other apartments in the area. As Ashi explained as he brought the children into the tiny one's office. The place had been gutted and now all that remained were two air mattresses and two tiny dressers. It's not much as Ashi tried to tell them, but Hitoshi fell flat onto the first air mattress. This is so comfy, came Hitoshi's muffled voice. Here he had to crawl into the second bed. She bounced up and down before giggling. It is, she agreed. Hitoshi sat up and his ashy watched as the boy's eyes lit up. Cat. He called and soon he had Tiny Tim in his arms. However, his happiness was short-lived as he frowned. What? He paused and chewed on the inside of his cheek. What's wrong? His ashy asked in a quiet tone. The others. He whispered. The cat's in the school with us. Oh, animal control had to claim them. They were all sick due to the mold. Hitoshi visibly slumped at this. I understand. Thank you. He scratched Tiny Tim under his chin. The cat immediately purred at this attention. His ashy got down to Hitoshi's level. You were feeding them, yeah? He asked as he reached over to pat Tiny Tim. Hitoshi nodded silently. They, they were all house cats that got abandoned. I see. Well, at least now they'll go to a good home. A home that deserves them. 
Hitoshi didn't look so convinced about that, but he didn't argue it. How many kiddos do you have? Iri asked as she walked up to Brad. This one is funny looking. We have four five if you count Spicy. Spicy, Moss, Iri, Hitoshi told her as he let Tiny Tim go. Hey, that's a Cornish Rex. These cats are the few that are hypoallergenic. He walked up to Brat same as Iri. They have little to no fur, so they get cold really easily. They love to lay on shoulders or between legs because that's often where we're the warmest. He explained to the little girl as he reached over and patted Brat. You know your cats. His ashy smiled. Yeah, I love cats if it wasn't obvious. Hitoshi then went quiet again. He rubbed at his nose before standing up and looking at the room. Hazashi gave Hitoshi a smile before looking back down at Uri. Anything you guys want for dinner? We figured since it's your first official night in our household we should order in. Order in? Uri inquired quizzically. Someone else cooks for us, Hazashi explained. Uri still looked confused by the notion. Hitoshi sat on the air mattress and shook his head. Here, Hazashi pulled takeaway menus out of his pockets. Why don't you leaf through and circle what you want? Will that make you feel better? Hitoshi knew he must have looked a little apprehensive but in the end, he nodded. Hiri cuddled up close to one another and leafed through the multiple menus. Hiri was mostly confused by the whole thing. In the end, they went with ramen as Hitoshi figured it was the safest option. What's wrong? Hazashi inquired as Hitoshi knew he was looking worried. Then, he said his biggest fear. Honestly, the thing that's been bugging him since it was announced that he was being foster. Why'd you guys take me and dot 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 or he looked back at Hiri who was preoccupied with Brat. I understand. But why me? You, my quirk is villainous. You all should have turned me away the moment I was caught using it. I don't understand. He shook. As Ashi gently cupped Hitoshi's cheek. Because you're human, the same as her. Quirk or no quirk, villainous or heroic, we would have helped you no matter what. He explained. Then, he ruffled Hitoshi's hair. By the way, you're not a villain and neither is your quirk. You can't control what you were born with, kid. Hitoshi was too stunned to speak. He just watched in silence as Hazashi walked away. But, I don't understand. His whole life he was told he was a villain and now, 13 years later, he's being told it wasn't true. It didn't make sense. Hitoshi flopped onto the air mattress once more and watched Uri for a few seconds. I'm sorry if I scared you back there, he told her. Uri looked confused. When? When I put that man Kai under. I wasn't scared of you. She softly explained and came up to Hitoshi. I was scared of Kai. Scared of how he might. Hurt you. But he didn't. And, I'm glad. I don't want Kai to hurt Big Brother. Iri wriggled up on the same bed and pressed her head against his shoulder. I would have been sad. Hitoshi reached over and touched her horn gently. Iri, I would have been sad to lose you too. You and Moss. Speaking of Moss, Hitoshi watched as the cat came strolling into the room. His cat easily jumped onto the mattress and claimed his rightful spot under Hitoshi's chin. Yeah, this felt dot 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 this felt nice. The question for Hitoshi was always in the back of his mind. Everywhere he went this question loomed over his shoulder like a bird ready to strike. How long will it last? 